the problem with sex, it was always sort of this random thing that we just sort of hopefully I'll figure it out one day. I don't really understand it. I don't want to talk about it. I have shame about it. I'm not really sure when it's good and when it's bad and when I'm in the mood and when I'm not in the mood. So it's sort of this mysterious thing that we're all supposed to figure out. But now that we've started to realize it's actually a really integral part of overall health and wellness. Like if you are not sexually well, like let's say you don't feel great in your body, you're not communicating about sex in a healthy way, you don't take care of yourself, you're having erection challenges, orgasm challenges, it's it's gonna impact your entire life. I can give you tips all day. Like if you have an orgasm, I can say use this vibrator, use this lube, try this sex position, and that's all fine and good and that, that will work temporarily. But here's the thing. It's like people don't realize that all these things are connected. Like if you don't get great sleep, if you don't eat healthy, if you're not, if you haven't worked on trauma or gone to therapy, that's gonna impact your ability to have an erection. Maybe your hands are down your pants mm. and your parents are like, take your hand out of your pants, that's dirty, that's wrong, don't do that, why are you doing that? Or maybe your parents walk in on you. Your first connection yeah. to sex and to your body is that it's shameful and wrong. But like I'm here to tell you, and it's because people don't tell people this, that it's great to masturbate whether you're in a relationship or out of a relationship, it's part of connecting to your body and being healthy. Okay, so you hear us talking to Emily Morse. She's amazing. She's a doctor of human sexuality, and she hosts uh, the number one sexuality podcast, Sex with Emily. In fact, it's been on air for over two decades. We love her. She's hilarious and great and very smart. And she just authored a book that's going to be coming out uh, soon. In fact, you can get it on pre-order. It's called Smart Sex, How to Boost Your Sex IQ and Own Your Pleasure. So we know you're going to love this episode. We also have some programs on sale right now, but before I tell you about those, here's the giveaway. Maps Anabolic. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. All right, here's the sale. Maps Prime. Maps Prime Pro and the Prime Bundle, all 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Dr. Emily. Thank you for coming back on the show. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. We it's were talking four years. It's been a while. Four years. Uh -huh. yeah. Lots happened since then. A lot has We've happened. had a lot of sex since then. I know. It sounds yeah. like it. <laughs> Lots of Productive rats. sex. Yeah, yes, very productive. That's yeah. right. Yeah, we've had three, like three kids. kids <laughs> three kids have had, been had since the last time. Uh, wow, yeah. it's about time. Yeah. yeah. You know, before we, we turned the mics on, you made a comment. I want to go back to you. You said how the health and wellness space has kind of adopted more so um, sex as a part of health, which I think mm -hmm. is a very good thing. I think it's a yes. very, very important part of human behavior and health. And let's talk about that for a second. Okay. Why is sexual health so important? Why is it such a good thing that sexual health is now being, um, is, is now a, a part of this wellness kind of health movement? <sighs> I'm so grateful for this because the problem with sex, it was always sort of this, and this is still how people think about sex. And it's sort of this, random thing that we just sort of hopefully I'll figure it out one day. I don't really understand it. I don't want to talk about it. I have shame about it. I'm not really sure when it's good and when it's bad and when I'm in the mood and when I'm not in the mood. So it's sort of this mysterious thing that we're all supposed to figure out. But now that we've started to realize it's actually a really integral part of overall health and wellness. Like if you are not sexually well, like let's say you don't feel great in your body, you're not communicating about sex in a healthy way, you don't take care of yourself, you're having erection challenges, orgasm challenges, it's going to impact your entire your life. So now to kind of say, okay, we understand that sexual health is overall health is just a really, it was a really beautiful thing. Yeah, so it is, means that we have to have conversations now about it in a real way. Is it safe to say that oftentimes issues with sexual health, the reason why it's such, it's so important is that it's this great, like canary in the coal mine type thing. Like, okay, so I have orgasm issues, but that may be related to something a little bit deeper or erect, erectile issues, mm -hmm. or I have shame around sex. So by looking at sexual health, I'm able to kind of identify or look at deeper things. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, then I can't necessarily look at those things. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's exactly it. And that's what I just wrote this book about. So I was writing this book called Smart Sex. And when I'm writing it, it's like, okay, I've been doing this for almost 20 years. I'm just going to put all my best tips and all the things in there so people can have it in one place. And then when I was writing it, I was like, you know, I can give you tips all day. Like if you have an orgasm, I can say, use this vibrator, use this lube, try this sex position. And that's all fine and good. And that, that will work temporarily. But there's so much depth to sexual challenges that we have. So I came up with these five pillars of sex, I'm calling it sex IQ. 
So how do you become sexually intelligent? You have to look at these five factors that are going to contribute to you being sexually well and healthy because it's not about just one thing. Like if the three of us, like if we all couldn't have an orgasm, let's say, there'd be a lot of different reasons why, you know? So it's like, it's it's emotional, it's mental, it's psychological. So people don't, re- but here's the thing. It's like people don't realize that all these things are connected. Like if you don't get great sleep, if you don't eat healthy, if you're not if you haven't worked on trauma or gone to therapy, that's going to impact your ability to have an erection, right? It's Mm -hmm. not just because you are watching too much porn that could be part of it. So I don't think that people ever did the deep dive into really realizing that there's so many factors that go into it. Mm. You're the perfect person to ask this, um, that, you know, when we were younger, I mean, let's say 20 years ago and before there was so much shame around sex. I still, I still think there's a lot around it, but I think that the pendulum has moved in a direction where, um, it went from shame to um, it's now purely physical lust. And, and I see a lot more of this than I did before. Okay. Or maybe trivialized or separated from some of the, like I, like I read a statistic the other day that okay. the best sex, people who have the best sex tend to be uh, pe- couples who have been together for a long time who are like in their 50s, I read, or something yeah. like that, 40s and 50s. Which you, if you, if you, you know, popular media would have you thinking it's when you're in your 20s and yeah. you're super exactly. fit and all that stuff. Yeah. So do you, do you see changes over the last two decades where, you know, maybe that, that the pendulum is going in the wrong direction? Or has or it always been that way? Overcorrecting? Like, yeah. So, so you're, to clarify, you're saying that it has, is it, is shame not really a thing anymore? And it's more about. Like, do sex- we still see shame, but now yes. it's also this, this other issue of where it's like this super, it's just purely physical, very disconnected mm. type of I thing? I think that those have always been things. Unfortunately, okay. I think that shame is still a huge, is a huge challenge. I think stress, trauma, and shame are the pleasure thieves. Like that is what's keeping Mm. us from pleasure. And a lot of us have shame that we don't even realize that we have around sex. And that's why it's the way we're talked about it when we're younger. And then we Mm -hmm. think it's something that we can't talk about. So I still think that shame is there. Give me Um, an example of that. Like where that's that's common, where someone is is, like, let's paint me a picture of somebody who's listening right now, who who potentially may have shame around sex that doesn't even realize they have shame around sex. I love this question. Okay, so- you guys all have kids, right? Yeah. So now let's say when you're younger, you might even realize maybe your hands are down your pants mm. and you're sitting around the dinner table and your parents are like, take take that away. Like we were young, they're like, take your hand out of your pants. That's dirty. That's wrong. Don't do that. Why are you doing that? Or maybe mm. your parents walk in on you. So your first, your first connection yeah. to sex and to your body is that it's shameful and wrong. Now you might even be pre-verbal. You might be like a toddler. And that's the very first Mm. message that you got around sex. So then you always feel shame when you're masturbating, which by the way, talking about sexual health, part of being healthy overall is having a healthy relationship to masturbation. Mm. So I don't often have to remind men to masturbate. They're just like, cool, I got that down, right? (laughs) They're like, I was doing it safe way. I'm like, no, dude, put it away. Don't do it safe way. But but for women, sometimes there is shame around it. And even for men, they're like, I got to hide it or my partner makes me feel bad about it. So that's just an, an example where... We might not even be realizing, but like I'm here to tell you, and it's because people don't tell people this, that it's great to masturbate whether you're in a relationship, you're out of a relationship. It's part of connecting to your body and being healthy. So that's part of it. I think that there's still, so that that's a big shame that a lot of us carry around. So to avoid something like that uh, as a parent, uh, by the way, you can move your mic up a little. There you go. As a parent would be like your kids touching their privates and to treat it like if they were touching their leg or their ear. So rather than being like, don't do that. Yeah, exactly. Y- yeah. It, so, y- it could be more like we're in public and you might say, Hey, that's something you could do. So uh, Katrina, Katrina's mother, you would, cause we've had this with the, the, the little nephews and, and stuff like that, that done that would say something like, Oh, that's your me time when you're in your room. Yeah, exactly. like she won't even, she won't even make right. a big deal about it. She'll just be like, Hey, save that for when you're in your, your me like your, your me time in your own room. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not out here exactly. in, the, in the living room that's with everybody. Exactly it. You don't want to make it like a, that's wrong. Or right, I can't right. Believe you not, did that. It's not a big, huge deal. Just say, Hey, save that for when you're. do that later. And you Oh, that feels good, right? That yeah. feels rubbed. Sure, that feels good. Let's just wait till we're, you know, alone. not at the dinner table. Yeah. Till you're alone. Interesting. So, uh, what about a, it, it, you said masturbation is good? Is there an unhealthy relationship with masturbation? Yes, that could also there happen? absolutely okay. are unhealthy relationships with masturbation. So, it's like anything. It's like a if you find that masturbation is something that's like taking over your life. For example, you're masturbating so much that it's impacting your ability to show up for work. Jesus, it's. It's you're like, well, one more time, one more. <laughs> it's impacting your ability to 
have sex with your partner because you can't get hard, you can't get turned on unless there's porn in background and you're thinking about porn or you keep escalating the porn that you're watching to more extreme levels where when you're watching it, you're like, I don't even feel good about this, but I have to keep mm. escalating. So those are when you know that there's problems when it's having, when there's consequences. It's like any kind of, I don't, people, there's like conflict in this world about, in the sex world about if there could be addiction with porn or and I'm not going to, with masturbation and I'm not going to, but, but essentially, if you are addiction, you have a challenge with anything, it's when there's consequences. Is this why you're late all the time, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. This explains it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, this is this has got to be, uh, this is, uh, I hear people talking about this more now than ever. I mean, when we were younger, pornography was so <clears throat> hard to come by and now it's so accessible. And now you're hearing, uh, you know, uh, men saying they have erectile dysfunction at young ages yes. because of it. And then you mentioned something that is relatively new where the uh, porn genres or types are getting more and more extreme. Exactly. What's happening with that? Oh my God. Well, first, so here's what's happening with porn is that now kids are seeing porn as early as eight years old. Oh. So they're like on their phone, they're playing Candy Crush and all of a sudden there's some boobs and they're like, what ha <laughs> well, you know, what's happening? So that, so, and then there's not a lot of um, education. So porn without education is really problematic. Without sex education is problematic and it's everywhere now. So, you know, especially for the kids who grew up, you know, the iPad generation, or they grew up with the phone in their pocket or the iPad, like they have seen it everywhere. And so, and it is becoming more extreme, more readily available. And we are seeing more erectile challenges um, for people at younger ages, for sure, because that's, again, where they, yeah, it was harder to come by, right? Yeah. Literally, or easy to come by, but hard to come by, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> when you said that, I was like, wait, nice. there's some kind of fun in there. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, because it was like a magazine or whatever it was, and it was just, but now it's, it's, it's accessible all of the time. And so, you know, everything is conditioning, right? <clears throat> so it's like you could get conditioned to being able to call up whatever you want to see right there in the moment. And you're like, oh, it's a lot easier than having to go out and approach somebody. So now we have all these younger people who are having a hard time connecting with humans, mm -hmm. right? They're like, well, I'm already getting my needs met with porn. So, you know, that's a problem. But I don't bash porn either because we all know porn has its uses. Right. So obviously, uh, I think everyone here would agree probably an eight-year-old seeing something like that with no education is a horrible idea. But what about somebody who's like a, because I, I try and put myself back into teenage years mm -hmm. when I was scouring, uh, you know, the magazine piles yeah. for the JCPenney <laughs> article or anywhere I could see a boob, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, if I had the access like most probably high school kids do with their phone, you know, how would you coach them or how would you speak to them to have a healthy relationship with that? Because I don't, I don't necessarily know how good I would be. Like back then, you would have to have like a magazine article like that that you would have to find in order to use. Yet if I had my phone where I had Pornhub on it that I could have access to it all the time. Mm -hmm. God, I don't know. I don't know how I would have been in high school. It's hard to say because yeah. I'm not I'm not this 40-year-old responsible adult. I mean, obviously I think how I would want to act, but I'm not sure how I would. So how would you coach uh, a, a young man who's got that uh, access on how he should use it? Uh, yeah, it's a really good question. And I, and I, I think you would say, see, this is where it's on parents because I think a lot of kids, you think, oh, I, we don't want, to hear our parents talking about sex. Yeah. Like that's just, ew, gross. Like dad, don't talk to me about it or mom. But the more that we do and we normalize it, we start to say like, you know, son, you're going to hear me talking about it. This is not going to be like, it's not a one-time conversation like growing up and it was like the birds and the bees. This has to be the thing, like a way to talk to him about it is like, so I, I just want you to know you might come across porn and here's the thing, you know, that is, that is a version of sex. It's actually not real. It's not, it's not, it's, it's scripted. Um, it's an extreme version of sex. It can be, you just talk to them like like you would about how what's maybe what's realistic, what's not in it. Um, like to me, I look at porn, I'm like, oh my God, like he's nowhere near her clitoris. There's that doesn't feel good at you, all. You, you said She's the same way we said somebody working out, right? Yeah. Like, oh, that's terrible exactly. form. That's you guys, that's <laughs> it. we're not even working the right I'm muscle right like there. Sportscaster I just like, well, get, yeah, exactly. Let's see the instant replay on that. Uh, finish you guys, move. it's I'm telling you, what we do is so similar in the sense of like sexual health and your overall physical health. Yeah. Like someone's like, how do I want to lose weight? You'd never say, well, just go on a diet or just lift this weight. You'd yeah. say, do all of these things. Yeah. The same thing goes for sex. You, there's mm. there's the, the five things I talked about, but it's very similar. But yet for you guys, it's much more normalized and you're watching. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get into that. But, but to go back to this, it's like, 
you know, you have to use real examples from maybe when you are, because it's an ongoing conversation. So it's not the birds and the bees. It's like, okay, so I want you to know that I know you saw porn and you might see porn. And I want you to know that that's, you know, the most important relationship is that one that you have with yourself and your own body. When you're with somebody, I want you to like talk about consent. I have some great podcasts about how to talk to your kids about sex, but there's, there's literally not a lot of great places for, unfortunately right now for me to send parents, um, to go. So it's really just, you're real with them about what so you know, you, what they know. So do you recommend then it organically comes up or that a, a, a dad formally or mom formally sits their kid down? So is that, a, so what I'm hearing from you is like mm. the best approach is d- life is going to happen. Get ahead of There's going to be a mm. situation where they come across something or they say something or they hear something at school and then to address it in that moment and then explain that the best you can as a parent mm-hmm. versus, man, my kid's getting to be about 14 now. I think I need to sit down and have this right. formal sex exactly. talk. Exactly. That's exactly like, oh, he's certainly in the shower for a long, lot longer right now. <laughs> like what's happening in there? That's what all my friends, are, my friends with kids are like, oh God, like I know he's doing it, but I don't want to talk to him. Like we have to talk to him, get ahead of it. It's like, say, so you're going to start getting erections or here's what puberty is mm-hmm. and it's yeah. hormones yeah. and you're going to start having these feelings. And I want you to know it's totally, it's totally okay. It's normal if you have questions about it. And then you can start to bring in media. Like maybe you're watching a movie one night at home with your kids and something happens. Maybe there's a kiss, like it's a high school scene and there's, so you stop it. Like, what do you think about that? I thought it was interesting that he was, it was consensual or maybe it wasn't consensual. You try to find things in media or in day-to-day life that sort of speaking to some of the the, the questions they might have as you find it because it is out there. And the thing is, it's like anything, it, it gets easier. I think that there's probably a lot of parents are going, oh my God, I could never do that. It's awful. But that's because that's the way we were raised. And the only place that we see a good example of this is in the Netherlands. And this has like been one of my missions is that in the Nether- in the Dutch countries, it's the only place in the world where they normalize talking about sex and it's totally okay. Pregnancy rates are low. They talk about you know, and they started at a very young age. Like the kids are, the kids are, you know, toddlers, pre-verbal. And so when they're talking to them about their body parts, it's not like they're saying like, here's how you put a condom when you're like 18 months Mm -hmm. old. But what they are saying is, you know, they're naming the parts. There's no shame around it. So they'll say like, this is your knees and this is your thighs and this is your penis and this is your, or this is your vulva. They're not saying like, they're not skipping over from your thighs to your stomach. Mm -hmm. They're naming the parts. They're talking about consent. Like they're talking about, so it's normal. And the parents and their sex education, like, okay. So in the States, our sex ed is like, don't get pregnant. Don't get don't have sex. Basically, you're going to get pregnant. You're going to get an STI and your life is going to be really, you know, challenging and hard. And, but in these other countries, they do talk about pleasure and they talk about orgasm and they talk about consent and they make sex. They don't make it so like scary. And as a result, kids, as they get older, they just every year in school, they're taught sex and sexual health and wellness and it's normal. So that's the world I want us to get to here in the States. That's uh, my mother-in-law's house. That's what, that's what dinner looks like. Really? <laughs> oh yeah. So being, I mean, I've been in part of this, her, their family now for like 13 years and it was quite the shock for someone like me to like hear like uh, a, you know, a grandma talk about blowjobs at a dinner table and stuff like that. Like <laughs> literally with kids all ages and stuff like that. Okay. But it, they, she openly will, then and the way it looks like in their family is because we have this massive family at all age ranges. And most of them are, most of us are adults. Uh, if she thinks that her daughter-in-law's skin looks really well, a lot of times she goes, oh, you guys having great sex right now. I see your skin. It's so glowing. It's to- It'll be at the dinner table. And okay. and so that will organically come up and in front of the kids. And it's, at, I mean, it was very weird for me at first yeah. to be a part of that, but it's also, it's, everybody in the family is very comfortable with- Take some of the intensity. Out it, of does. it does. It does. And, and, sex. and the kids get it introduced that way. Mm-hmm. Instead of them getting it from television or their friends at high school, yeah. they hear grandma- talking to Grandma. mom and dad or aunt <laughs> uncle about their sex life at, at the dinner table. Uh-huh. And it was really weird to get used to at first, but it actually has created this really interest. And I'm now obviously I've been 13 years, so I've seen these kids yeah. grow up. And so mm-hmm. I've watched them be seven, eight year olds now and then high school and they're really having a sex life and older. And it's something that can be discussed with seven of us sitting around right. yeah. and it's a wild. I love that. I see wild. that's, that's good. So you've probably seen, so it probably is a little bit. Oh yeah. It's very normal it. now. Uh-huh. It's very, very normal now for me. But, and it was a, it was a shock when I first came into You're the like, family. That's not okay, grandma. Oh What's yeah. Grandma no, doing I mean, on the table, imagine but... having a, a mother-in-law, you know, ask, you know, my wife about our sex life and blowjobs <laughs> and things like that right in front of me when we first met. That's it was, extreme. Yeah. It was very, very <laughs> extreme. That's a lot. It was a lot. I mean, there's a way 
the pendulum can swing and, yeah. and you get to decide. We all get to decide what yes. the right level is. But I mean, I, I see it now and, I, and I'm and i like, uh, wow, that's actually really cool to see how the, the uh, comfort level that the entire family yeah. has around that's that topic. Really- it's, it's actually no different than any other topic. So mm-hmm. it's just if it's no yes. different than the kid who's struggling with math in school with the, we're thinking about buying a house next year uh-huh. and like that because same, same conversation. That's exactly it. And so, that's, how, that's how I think it. Yeah, no, I was just curious um, it, because, you know, your doctor and your background yeah. and all these uh, studies, um, we've talked about like uh, kids as they get like imprinted, like uh, that being like a substantial moment with how they have sex later on in life. Uh Like what, what um, age typically is that where uh, that is so formative and um, also too, cause you hear about like some kinks and things that result as, As you know, as that imprint, um, you know, kind of leaves its, its mark. Um, like, can you just kind of talk through yeah. that, and, like some of those situations? So do you mean, so you're, you're talking about like, a someone who has like a fetish or a fantasy about something that happened when they were younger? Like yeah. A- or just like regular, you know, uh, encounter with sex, but like, it's, it's the way that they sort of perceive sex going forward mm-hmm. from there. Like what age would you say? Like typically that. I would say, God, it's so hard to say because we're all so different. It's like bio individuality, right? We are mm-hmm. all we are all so different. So there's not like a universal age, but there are instances where something can happen to a kid, and a lot of times it's like negative stuff or something will happen. Mm-hmm. They'll parents will maybe okay. So also shame comes from like if you grew up in like in a religious household, let's say, and you were always told that masturbation was wrong or don't have pre- sex only for procreation. And then you start to have sex, you might feel this like guilt around it or shame around it or or like, um, or maybe if you grew up so where like the nuns were telling you, so then you might have like a kink around it. You might develop some kind of like fantasies around the nuns because let's say you're at like at a young, you're at a formative age when you're going through puberty, right? So that's mm-hmm. when your hormones start to spike, it starts to come in. And then you might be having some sexual thoughts at that time. And it might sort of co-mingle, if you will, mm. with some kind of fantasy or something like someone is like a, a fantasy, let's say for about redheads. Like I'm always obsessed with redheads. I don't know why. Like maybe they had like a second, you know, third grade teacher or something where they kind of had these feelings for their teacher at the time. They didn't, couldn't really explain it, but then their hormone there at the time, they were also starting to go through puberty. And so it sort of got linked up like their penchant for redheads and sexual fantasies might get linked up with something it's sort of like a perfect storm of hormones and kinks and fantasies. That was that, my theory. When is we that were what talk- you're? Yeah, we were all yeah. talking about this oh, on really? a podcast not that long ago. Well, we were talking about like weird things. I think it came up with a foot fetish. Oh yes. yeah, and I okay. and I theorized like you know because I know what happened to me. I, I tell a story and I don't know if I've shared it on the podcast. I know I shared it with these guys. You, you have <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I I was sexually imprinted because one of the first times that a girl had ever touched me in that I'm in I'm in high school. I've already gone through puberty and everything, and I was sick. I was like deathly sick. So to this day, if I'm sick, I'm like always in the mood, and I swear it's because that was imprinted yes, on me. Exa- and I told the guys, I'm like, you know, if someone has like this weird, like they were, we're saying like, why would you like have a foot fetish? I'm like, well, imagine being in high school and the first time you ever get touched down there as a guy, it's the girl at cafeteria. She sneaks her foot, <laughs> rubbing exactly. over her foot and starts yeah. rubbing. That is exactly it. Okay. So early, it is early memories that, that usually happens when you're, it's all new and that's hmm. where a lot of them originate. What, what sure. are the components like? Because obviously having good sex, it's it's not just the physical pleasure, there's connection, there's uh, the confidence, there's being vulnerable. Like what are the components of like really healthy, good sex? Mm, wow, that's such a great question. I mean, I think it's mostly is communication. I always say communication is a lubrication and I will, it, it is really about not only the communication that you have with your with your partner, but with yourself. Like what are the messages that you're telling yourself about sex so that you have to be comfortable with it? Um, that's a great component about it. I think also being with somebody that you feel safe with and that you trust, talking about your fantasies and your desires and what you what you want. That's one of the components. Another one is is your overall health and wellness. Like, are you mentally healthy? Are you physically healthy? And I think if you are somebody who, like people who are healthier, we've talked about this before too, like it's all about blood flow, let's say, your mm-hmm. erections or your orgasms. If you're moving your body regularly, you're exercising, you're eating healthy, like you're going to have more blood flow and you're going to be more likely to be aroused, turned on, ready for sex. So that's another important like pillar of wellness. Also your mental health. If you've had, you know, if, you know, therapy is going to help everything. But if you, let's say you've had some traumas growing up, and they've impacted your ability to connect with somebody, or maybe it was a sexual trauma, 
you know, and you haven't dealt with that in therapy, it's not going to go away. So you have to like look at your your overall health. You have to look at your your um your confidence level too. This is what I call about the self the self acceptance. Like, do you accept yourself where you're at right now? Do you feel comfortable with your? If you're walking, and you guys can really relate to this. If you're walking around all day. And you're like, I hate my body. I yeah. can't believe I didn't work out. Yeah. I don't look good. I've gained weight. I And then you expect, so here's, here's the disconnect. When you asked me earlier, like why is sex is now becoming under the wellness umbrella? Because if you are disconnected all day, you're like, I don't like my body. I hate it. And then you get in the bedroom with somebody and you're like, why aren't I in the mood for sex? Sure. Why aren't I aroused? Why mm-hmm. don't I feel sexy? Whether, no matter what your gender, why can't I get an erection? Why? Because you've been hating on your body all day. You are not accepting yourself. You're not, there's not a lot of acceptance and confidence. And then it's also, yeah. So that would be a big factor of it too. So like, how well do you know yourself? Do you, how well do you advocate for yourself? So it's really about, you know, this is why I talk about in the book too, is like these five pillars and I do this myself. So if I, and listen, people are like, oh, do you have the best sex ever? I'm like, I, I know how to have the best sex ever, but I also know how to troubleshoot it. And for me, I think about the five pillars. I'll think in my head, like, why, how do I get, in the mood for sex, I have to know that I am moving my body. For me, that's really important. Am I healthy? Am I eating right? I have to communicate it with my partner. These are the pillars. It's like, I have we talked about, you know, is there something that I've been holding on to? Do I have any resentments with him? Have I, you know, if I'm not feeling great about something, I'm not going to be able to have the best sex if I haven't communicated with my partner. If I don't feel great in my body, if I don't acknowledge the fact that like, there's certain things that need to be set up for sex as well. Like if I walk into my house and it's freezing cold or it's messy, I'm not going to be in the mood for sex, mm-hmm. right? So I, I really kind of reverse engineer it. And I think of all the things that could go wrong and what do I, what elements do I need to be in place for it to go right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You mentioned communication and, and connection. It, it, it makes me think of like breakup sex. People are always like, break, oh, not breakup sex, excuse me, makeup sex. <laughs> right. Makeup sex is like the best sex ever. And it's like, well, probably because you were like, fighting on the verge of, you know, separating. Yeah. And then you came together and you felt so close. Forced communication. Exactly. And then it's like, it feels so good to be connected again. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. No, breakup sex is a real thing because again, you're getting like the, the stimulation of the adrenaline and the dopamine. And so that's the added, mm. the feel good hormones come into that. So you have to have a dip. It's a changing up your pattern. Cause listen, the thing that kills our sex life is monotony and the same things over and over again. And what we crave in long-term relations is spontaneity, variety, um, we crave like something a little bit new and different. And it doesn't have to be like crazy, like swinging from the rafter sex. It could literally be a bottle of lube, like the lube mm-hmm. you're going to bring on with you tonight. It could be that, but it's something that's just a little bit, a little bit different. So if you got in a fight and you had this like fear, maybe you were in fight or flight, even if not that you thought you were going to get divorced, but it was something different. Right. And then you made up again and it was a relief. So you're having those, those dips mm-hmm. in the dopamine spikes and, so that's part of it. Yeah. You, Emma, you bring up uh, lube a lot and obviously <laughs> sex, I do. Uh, sex toys. I mentioned that that's one of the great factors for yeah. having great sex with lube. <laughs> so, okay. So I do, I have questions around that because uh, Talk to me. we, uh, God, I can't even remember the last time that Katrina and I used lube. It's okay. been a very, very long time. And it's mainly because we never Don't. have to. Right. And so- I kind of look at it like a thing where it's like with the way we talk about protein shakes and bars, it's like my goal, I would think for my sex life is like my fitness health and fitness life where it's like, I want to try and get all everything through whole natural foods. And, and if I can hit those markers, <laughs> I'm the healthiest I can be. Now, if for some reason I'm, I'm missing protein, take, then, then shakes and bars make a lot of sense to supplement that because they're very helpful for that. Would you say that's similar to lube? Like if I have this incredible sex life where she gets unbelievably lubricated yeah. herself, yep. I don't have this need for that. So I shouldn't use that. I, I totally love that you're saying this because I, I could see why that would be, we would think that would be the case, but lube is different. Okay. I'm Fine. so glad you asked this because actually lube is more like sunscreen. Think of lube as being like, you know, when it's cloudy out and your mom's like, you have to wear sunscreen. You're like, but it's cloudy and you sure. can still get, you can still get a tan. You can still get burned in okay. the sun. So here's the thing about lube. I want to like the education around lube is that, is that lube is a safety measure. So sometimes we could be really, really wet and not turned on. Sometimes you can be turned on and not wet. That's the thing I also want to mention about lube is that it, especially for a woman, well, we're the ones getting wet, is that it changes with our cycles. So there's certain times of the month where we're wet, not wet enough, or we're wet for a little bit. At the, so sometimes at the start of sex too, we're really wet. And then we're not, and so we might not be as wet if it goes a little bit longer. 
or it's just not a guarantee. The problem with not being wet enough for sex or not having enough is the friction. So if there's too much friction, then there's tears, you can get infections. That's one problem. So if you just add a few drops of lube to every sexual situation, it's a safety measure so you don't have, because sometimes you're caught up in the moment and you're like, I was really, you know, wet at the beginning, but I, I didn't realize I wasn't. And then you can have tears again that cause to get infections, STIs, um, stuff like that. And the second thing is, there was a study by, a groundbreaking study by Indiana University, which is the Kinsey Institute, leading research place about sex. And they found that when you added a few drops of lube to any sexual situation, women are 80% more likely to have an orgasm because of the nerve endings and the clitoris and all that. So even if it's just a little few drops when you're like starting to have sex, you put a few drops on your hand or you put it on your penis or you put it on her vulva and you rub it in, she's more likely to to have, you know, so it's safety. So that's why it's a little bit like, I, I literally have my dream is a lube on every nightstand. So it is a, a requ- even though you don't need it, mm-hmm. I just would love to know what it would feel like just to know that it's there and it's consistent and it might just feel yeah, like and different. Interesting. I also feel like positioning in a way where a woman may think, well, I'm going to use this if I can't get wet enough might actually create uh, either pressure or shame. Let's talk about the app. To the person who said, what's wrong with me? Why can't I? I feel aroused. And then it just causes more yes. problems rather than it being like, this is just a thing that we have. Well, wait, I'm so glad you, because this is the other shame thing. So yeah. here's lube has been shamed. So lube has been the thing where you're like, yeah, I think I have a bottle of lube. It's like underneath the bed yeah. or it's like back in the, in the, in the bathroom and it's hidden in the second shelf because our misunderstanding about about it is that is that if you're a guy and you're with a woman, you're like, oh, she's not turned on. Mm-hmm. I did something wrong. My penis must not be great, or I did something that you know we we you guys are direct, directly. It's your ego, right? Or you right. think you're connected to it. But I want to like make everyone just like breathe a sigh of relief and let you know that that's why I said like she can be super turned on and not wet, or she could be really wet, not turned on. This is just like a safety measure because it feels good. And penises love lube too. Like Mm. use it for masturbation. Like it's just, it's a great safety. So I just want to say like, I hope if anyone takes anything from this cover, like that is just a really big factor because I've just seen it. I mean, I've people use lube and they just feel, you know, they feel great about it. In some ways it reminds me of like, um, like with erectile dysfunction that oftentimes the reason why the man can't get an erection has nothing to do with the fact that his wife or his partner isn't turning him on. Could be something else. Could be a health issue. Could be stress. Yes. Um, And they even show repeated use of, uh, you know, erectile dysfunction medications. Men will start to develop a psychological attachment. Like if I don't take this, oh no, what's going to happen? Exactly. Type of deal. So I could see it being very similar in that sense. It is very exactly. That's exactly it. There's just all these things people don't realize that sex is so psychological too, and it's patterning. Extremely psychological. Oh my god, we get so set in our ways. Like this is the only way that I can masturbate. This is the only way I can orgasm. And this is the only thing that turns me on. And and it's um it's just conditioning. So it's like making the decision that I would like to explore other ways to have pleasure and other ways to have orgasm. And I think that hopefully that should feel good to people because you, if you do have erectile dysfunction, you don't have to live with it. Especially now, there are so many ways to 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 to, to deal with it, mm-hmm. to work with it. Like it, it could be health, it could be you know exercise, diet, testosterone, your hormone replacement. <clears throat> um, using different toys can help. There's just a lot of solutions to it. And we're not just, you're not, our sex life is not a fixed state. Yeah. Mm. It's are, like your health. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Are there, are there common challenges between the sexes? Meaning like I could see like uh, the, the pressure to provide for the, as the man tends to uh, hinder our sex life a lot, or the, the confidence of my wife and how she feels sexy about herself is, are there common themes that you see within the sexes and challenges? And then if there are, what are some of the yeah. best things to address those? God, it's a great question. I mean, I used to think that we were so different, but um, that men always want sex and women don't, or yeah. men are in tar- and, and like, I can't, none of it. I actually, in, in my book, I didn't even use gender. I was like penis owners and, and, and vulva owners. And like, we're, and then I was like, there's only a few areas where I was like, we're, we're really different. And that's just when it comes down to our biology and like women can have more orgasms. Our refractory period is a lot you know, quicker than men's. But, but basically our challenges are, yeah, confidence challenges, having to initiate. So I, I see some of our challenges would be around performance. Okay. Ar- desire. So let's talk with, let's start with desire. Desire discrepancy is the number one question I get asked mm. by people is, there's in every relationship, there's someone with a high libido 
and a low libido. Oh, right. Always. Right. The two high libido partners don't ever get together. And the two low libido partners <laughs> mm-hmm. never get together. Mm-hmm. So I want everyone to feel good that there's always going to be someone in the relationship who's going to want it a little bit more. Okay. And so some, so, so I saw for that. It switch, right? What? It can't switch. It can't switch. But unfortunately, the only time it's ever the same is the honeymoon phase. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like in the beginning, you cannot wait to rip your clothes off, to rip the clothes off each other. And it's amazing and exciting. But we're never going to get back to that. We're not. We might on vacation. We might. We have separations from each other. Maybe after a fight or something is new and exciting. But it just can't be new again. It just can't. But and that's okay too. So how we solve for this desire discrepancy is first, like you said, yeah, it can switch over time, and then you acknowledge it. I mean, again, if you are in a relationship where not only are you talking to your kids about it, but with your partner about it regularly, like just yeah. So I've been feeling more in the mood this week. Like, are we going to have? Sex on, you know, what about sex tonight? I mean, and then you say, well, you know what? Tonight I'm exhausted. I want to go to bed early, but Saturday night is going to be our night. That's our date night. We can look forward to it. We know what's going to happen. So if you're somebody who is the, let's say you're the lower, so the lower desire partner has the power. The low desire partner is the one who's deciding when sex is going to happen or not. So then acknowledging that with your partner and saying, okay, you know, I, what what would feel right to us to have sex? So let's say you're someone who wants sex five days a week, but I only want it one day a week. Well, that's about what? Like one and a half to two times a week. And so you're like, okay, well, how do we troubleshoot that? And that's when you got to reverse engineer and say, well, when do we know we want to have sex the most often? It's definitely not, like I know for me, like I do not want to have sex during the week after like 11 o'clock at night. I try to get to bed early. Um, I know that like I'm already, you know, wash my face, I'm in bed, I'm like ready. So I- I think when we expect sex just to happen randomly, like we're in bed, this is when sex can happen. Like that doesn't work for many people, especially if you have kids and you have life and you get up early. There's no random sex when you have kids. There's no (laughs) random sex when you have kids. You got to plan for sex. You have to schedule sex. And I know people think that is like the least sexy thing in the world. Like you don't want to look at your calendar and be like, time to like pick up the kids at school and make dinner and then have sex. But when you plan for it, just like your workout, a workout is, is, you guys, I can't tell you how similar it is to like planning your workouts, prioritizing it. It's not going to randomly happen. You're not going to wait till you're suddenly in the mood. And unfortunately, since we get turned on in different ways, it's probably not going to hit you over the head that you're just going to be in the mood for sex. So you have to sort of reverse engineer it and think when is the best time? Like the kids, have, there's a babysitter this night, or we're going to get up early on Saturday morning. Because sex is important and it has to happen, but you have to figure out in a relationship when is the best time for it to happen. Yeah, we've had to learn how to really schedule dates. So it's really like because of the communication factor that you're talking about, like that really like proceeds, like it has to happen that way in order to have good sex. Otherwise, you can just have sex and you're planning it out. But then it's just like, you know, oh, let's hurry up and let's get to it uh, versus really kind of like, you know, scheduling enough time to, to connect and yeah. have that That's first. the communication yeah. part. It's That's like, I can't get in the mood part. unless the house is messy yeah. or I need to, you know, we need to be able to talk about it beforehand. That right. works for me. It can't be too late because I got to wake <clears> up early and you plan it. I think it could be, it could be pressure. And that's where people are like, I don't like it. Or, you know, my opinion, it's more fun. Like it's, it's something to look forward to more fun. and mm-hmm. flirt towards exactly. and then try to meet each other's needs leading up to well, it so that it can happen. It's also, I think, recognizing the individual needs, right? So you you hit a bunch of things that like over the course of 13 years, like I think Katrina and I have pieced together. Like for one, she's like way colder than I am. So I've learned like if I have the house at my temperature, yeah. I like <laughs> she's all bundled up and getting her to take all her clothes off is right. very low. So I'll deal with the house being a little warm yeah, if I want to get some bit. earlier. Right. I also recognize this. Like if uh, um, you talk about the communication piece, um, uh, if we sit down, there's a great, uh, there's a great game. I've talked about it on the show before. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just uh, I forget the name table. It's called table conversations, I think. Oh, yeah. And it's just conversation starters, but it gets us talking about stuff even after 13 years that we didn't know about each other or, you know, she'll share something, a childhood memory because of the question. And that always fosters this crazy intimacy afterwards. Another thing you hit that was a huge hack yeah. for us was, you know, we love to watch our favorite TV shows and this and that. And then we, we'd mosey on up to bed at 10, 30, 11 o'clock yeah. at night. And typically one or the other, would it be more tired than the other person? Right. And even if we were maybe both wanting it four hours ago, we don't end up having it because one person ends up falling asleep. So simply disciplining ourselves to like, you know what, like, let's just go to the bedroom at eight o'clock. And that's it. So you don't have to formally plan. Exactly. Oh, we're having sex tonight. It's just like, hey, let's yeah. go up to the room right. by eight o'clock right. tonight. And then just let conversation happen. That conversation always ends up leading to sex. So mm-hmm. these things have all been things that I know mm. that we piece together. Are there more things like that that come to mind for you 
as far as like, man, sometimes I can give someone this little subtle tip. Another tip I've given people is like, we uh, listen to audio books together. And that connection of growing and learning together has um, very rarely do we ever get through a full hour, mm -hmm. two hours of the book. It ends up into sex, you know, 30 minutes later. Yeah. So have you found things like that sometimes that you can just give somebody mm -hmm. that was like, all they need was that little tweak? Yeah, it's totally. Um, I mean, couples that like play together, stay together. So having habits like that, like do, or doing, you know, book together, working out together. Like I know like when I work out with my partner, like we always like we have our workouts, we do that. And that's going to definitely like we're sweating together. We're moving our bodies. We hike, we plan it. We talk about those things that, that definitely can help. I think planning like using toys. I'm a huge fan of toys, as you guys know, like having them charged, ready to go, um, I think is a big game changer. And also like planning for your sex life, like thinking about like what toy could we use or what you know, if you like, this is where I love porn, like what, showing each other different scenes that you like in porn to keep it interesting, going shopping for toys together, looking at it. So like kind of bringing in other stimuli could is really helpful for a lot of couples. I think I have something called the yes, no, maybe list. This has been like a game changer. I don't know if I, I don't think I had this before, but it's a free download on my, on my website at sexwithemily.com and there's like 80 sex acts on it. And I can't tell you, like, I didn't know how much this was going to impact people. Because think about with sex, there's no menu. There's no like, you want to spice it up. We've been doing missionary sex and occasional doggy style. Maybe we do 69, but we don't know what else the fuck there is to do that's going to mix it up. So this is like 80 things on it. And it says everything from like dirty talk. So it says a yes, no, and a maybe after every sex effort or every suggestion. It could be like taking a bath together, dirty talk, using toys, um, going to a sex party, um, uh, spanking you know, uh, everything, like some, some a little bit kinky or some not. So you each take it, right? And you like together, you can print it out or you can do it online and you're like, okay, so now we're going to sit together. What a great we're exercise. A date night. I mean, how many times are people like way off? You're like, oh shit, yeah. I didn't know you wanted I don't that. Think, I, think <laughs> you just, I think you just go through the list together and talk it's, about no, each or other. I, that feel too. Like, I feel like individually it'd be more fun. I feel like, like individually you do it and then, then you come go back like, and compare yeah, the then you come yes. back and compare the, the I mean, notes. They both could be fun, I think. Yeah. It's really yeah. fun Otherwise though. you're influenced. Yeah. If you're doing it right with your partner, you're influenced by what they're going to say. Yeah, it's great idea. It's so fun. Like we, you're like, oh, and then there's a lot of magic in the maybes too. You're like, oh, why is that a maybe? And that's where you find a lot of shame too, mm -hmm. or a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. So in the maybes, once you get through the yeah, because well, first off, you're like, oh my god, I didn't know you wanted dirty talk. I've been waiting for that to happen. Or you want to spank me? I want you to. I want to be spanked. <laughs> Who knew? Why didn't we ever talk about this? Like, let's go. Yeah. So it's literally is everything other. That's fun. But also in them, then you go to the maybes. You're like, oh, interesting. Like, why is that? Not not because you want to like coerce your partner, but you might find out like, oh, I had a bad experience with it. Or I was told that that was really dirty or wrong mm. or shameful. So then you kind of can crack the code and it, it sort of is a great fodder for like months, years to come. You just keep there. You redo it every year and see what's changed. So you kind of, and then you can also plan it out. So now we have all of these things to do. You know, why don't we try that thing? Or why don't we like, you know, and you start, because I think sometimes couples get so set in their ways and they're like, yeah, I want to role play, but my partner's going to really laugh if I ring the doorbell with like pretend I'm the pizza guy. Like that's, <laughs> that's, we've been together forever and they'll just laugh. And I just say to that, like, so what? Like, so you laugh, but what if you like stick in character for a minute and it's something funny and it's something new? Again, we're craving novelty. We're creating spontaneity and variety. Those are the three elements. So it could literally be sex in the in the bathroom when it's always in the, in the bedroom. It could be that you pretended, you know, you meet at a bar, sexy stranger, right? You show up and you're like, that's such a fun role play for couples to be like, like meet me at this bar and show up as, you know, your middle name or your alter ego or just even if you do it for 10 minutes like sometimes my boyfriend will show up with the rest of them like hi is this seat taken and like for 10 minutes we'll just do this thing I'm like no you can sit there I'm just waiting for someone but you're really cute and we'll just and then for a minute I'll just kind of go off like how was your day when you were and I'll see him differently right and I'll, yeah, yeah. I'm like okay so that's a really hot um, moment where I'm like oh yeah he is caught he's not really bothering me in this moment <laughs> you know like he was or annoying me <laughs> like you were 10 minutes ago so we have to remember that it's our memory it's so playful and we can have fun with this but our partner becomes like everything to us and we just think we don't want to you know have sex with them but if you can kind of create something new and fun and new fodder it can be really really mm -hmm. hot let's let's talk about orgasms for a second yes because um, uh, that's <laughs> obviously you know one of the best parts of, of sex um besides the connection what do people get wrong about orgasm what are some common misconceptions about oh my them? god i think that the common misconception for women is that something is wrong if they can't have an orgasm mm. during penetration. Only 20% of women are going to have an orgasm during penetrative sex. I think we've probably talked so about that. The vast majority need clitoral stimulation. They need clitoral stimulation. Okay. They need it 
they need foreplay, they need clitoral stimulation, and that's okay. Like that's okay if you it's not going to happen that way, and that and it's okay to use. You know, the majority of women are going to orgasm from like fingers or toys or mouth, and it's not because of your penis. Although for many, for some, they can, and that's great too. Um, I think that we also get wrong that there's only that we're set like the way that we orgasm is the only way we can orgasm because again, it's conditioning, it's patterning. That's how we've always done it. But if you're open to exploring, or you know what I love is I love another great tip for couples that they love is that is um, mutual masturbation. Because with mutual masturbation, first off- Super hot. Super hot. It's a sure thing. Like, first off, you know you're both going to have orgasms, but it's also (laughs) like you can learn. It's educational. You're like, oh. That's how you do it. I didn't know that you (laughs) put your hand over the tip and grab your balls. Like, I I never grab your balls. (laughs) I never grab your balls, and now I'm going to grab your balls, right? Not the balls. And you say, oh, not the balls. (laughs) See, we're all so different. I didn't know my last partner wanted their balls touched, and you do or you don't. So I think that's a really fun thing to do. And then you can also learn like what else, you know, I didn't think that I was able to have an internal orgasm or a G-spot orgasm as they call it because I was never able to during penetration. And it wasn't until I literally took matters into my own hands when I started this work almost 20 years ago that everything changed for me. I was like, oh, okay, so I have to use a toy in this certain way or it helps to already have a clitoral orgasm first. And then once I have a clitoral orgasm, all the nerve endings internally become mm. more engorged and I'm more likely to have a internal or G-spot orgasm as they call it. I call it G area. Mm. Um, I think what are some other, what else have I missed here? So for <clears throat> penis owners, I think, or for men, what are some of the misconceptions? I guess same thing that like can only happen in a certain way. Um, yeah, that that you can have a prostate orgasm. If you haven't gandered there, that's a fun topic. Interesting. That's, that's, that's all crickets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I almost brought you guys some prostate toys. Oh, I really? almost. Just to try it out. Well, I'm going to ship them to you. We're going to do a few you. more podcasts for you. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to ship them to you because <laughs> also I was yet. flying. Yeah. I didn't know. I wanted to bring you my closet like you had last time in my closet. So I just have to kind of gauge the water here. But <laughs> you could have an incredible orgasm if you stimulate your prostate. <laughs> Different. How how <laughs> how common is it for like your sexual preferences and ways you orgasm to evolve and change throughout like a relationship? A lot. Uh, oh, often. So that's the other thing that your your orgasm is not a fixed state it can get it can change as you get older maybe it's quicker when you're younger or it, it takes longer sometimes when you're older because our hormones are changing um and you just can have different kinds different ways i mean i find this for men a lot like they don't really realize that there's all these like places that can feel really good like stimulating their perineum which is like the taint like mm-hmm. in between you you guys know the the, the balls and your ass yeah. there's a little area that indirect stimulation to the prostate that can feel great and you might have a different kind of orgasm so i think it does change and also expecting that like maybe you can't come three times like you did in your 20s like i know i remember my boyfriend in my early 20s like he would come like three times and like 20 minutes or something like that just doesn't happen as much anymore because of hormones because we get older so you know your refractory period again the time that it takes to come again Mm. um, might take a little bit longer and so I think just kind of normalizing that is there any science to support my crazy mother-in-law and her (laughs) ideas around she could tell by skin and like I mean she feels like she like the way it's glowing you and now yeah no she literally she I, like I said, these com- these com- I'm not making these conversations up. Like I know, I want to come over for the giving hours. You, oh, you would just absolutely okay. love her <laughs> and love yeah, conversing with her because she is just an open book and loves to talk about this stuff. But yeah, she uh, she will all m- many times uh, you know ask my wife about our sex life because if she can tell by her the way her skin is like how I don't know that that's na- it can improve your for sure it can improve your skin circulation, but I don't know that you can tell that it's only because of sex yeah. that 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 it's going to be. I mean, if you were having a lot of sex or like all weekend long, you guys were in the bedroom under the covers and or doing your thing, you're not over the covers, maybe. But I don't, I don't think that it's okay. Yeah, yeah. that. It, it, let's talk about sex IQ. You, you mentioned this in the book, and that you mentioned five pillars. Yeah, can we talk about those? For yeah, a yeah, yeah. Let's talk, let's about, talk about the five okay. pillars. So. So the five pillars of sex IQ. So what I realized is after all these years, and you guys, this is why we're so similar. Like I got so many questions, right, over the years. Hundreds, thousands. I probably answered tens of thousands of questions. And then I realized it all boils down to maybe about like five. Do you guys have the same thing? Like, yep. do you have the same five oh, yeah. questions? Yeah. yeah. And, right? like, and, and the variations of it, it sounds different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, di- the deeper, the more you, the longer I've done this, the more I realize it all boils down to just like a few things. That's but it can it. be yeah. very different totally. how you communicate it. And, and, exactly. Yeah. So I realized after all these years, it really just, that, that whatever question anyone has, and this actually happened, like I said, when I was writing the book, I all of a sudden had this vision of like, 
I want people to, like every day I get an email from someone who can't have an orgasm or an email from a guy who can't get an erection or feels shame about his penis size or wants to know why he doesn't have the desire he used to or how do I ask my partner to blank? That's one of the top questions. Like, how do I get? And I was like, oh my God, you know, and, and I love it. I love it because everyone's story does come packaged a little bit different, but at the end of the day, it's the same things. Mm -hmm. So when I was writing, I was like, there's gotta be a way to empower people to, to kind of figure this out for themselves, to troubleshoot, if you will, to sort of reverse engineer whatever they desire they want and to look at these five areas. So the five pillars of becoming sexually intelligent start. The first one to look at is embody. And again, this is what I want to say is you never get to a place where you are like, five star, like sexually intelligent, where you're like, okay, I've got it now and I can move on and learn to play golf or something. It is an <laughs> ongoing thing where you always are working at this. Just Probably like, because you're always changing We talk about that with health changing. and fitness. It's health and fitness is the same thing. It's a journey. There's it's no a destination. It's a freaking journey. There is no, exactly. There is no destination here, but now you know what to look for. Right. You Now you know. So the first one is embodiment. So embodiment is just, am I aware of how thing, how, how my body feels mm. of like, even an embodiment exercise is like, you know, if you close your eyes and you like take your hands, I just my partner too, like to be connected, you put your hands over their wrists and I'm or right now I'm feeling like how it feels to touch myself. Like that is embodied. I'm feeling my hands on my wrist. Do I feel, you know, my feet on the floor? Am I embodied and in touch with my body as my movement? Oh, well, Can I comment okay. on that real yeah. quick? Yes. I want to comment on that real quick because someone may be listening and be like, well, of course I feel things. We see this in fitness all the time where yeah. we'll do an exercise with someone and they'll say, where am I supposed to feel this? Exactly. Yeah. And it's because we say this in fitness all the time. People are not in their bodies. Yes. It could also be disconnecting from certain emotions. So like men tend to disconnect from like emotions that may make them feel weak. And so because of that, Vulnerable, we tend to disconnect. Yeah. yeah. So we disconnect from our bodies as well because you can't do either or. It tends to be both. So what you're saying is such a big deal. I want people to know that this is like really, really big mm -hmm. and that most people um, have some issues with really being fully in their bodies. Fully in their bodies, especially during sex. We yeah. tend to disassociate. We tend to think like, I hope, you know, we go into our heads. We're yeah. fantasizing. We're like, I hope they don't notice that my you know left boob is bigger than my right boob yeah. or that my penis is not hard enough. And so we think of all the thoughts that you have yeah. during sex. If I tell you the only thoughts you should be having is like how something is feeling. And I talk a lot about that in the book about how to get into a place of embodiment really easy, easily by using your senses, you can immediately sink into that to be feel more embodied. If you're like, okay, when I'm starting sex, I'm worried about things or I didn't send this email off yet. Or mm -hmm. if you just immediately ground yourself and you're like, okay, I am, what am I, you take the five senses. What am I smelling? Okay. I'm smelling the vanilla candle. What am I seeing? I'm seeing my partner's body. What am I hearing? I'm hearing their breath. You go through the five senses and then you're like, grounded. And you might have to do that a few times mm. during sex, but that's going to mm. immediately bring you wow. present. So that's one of them. And that mm. is a, that helps with anxiety. That helps with stress. It helps anytime you're having thoughts that aren't serving you, but especially in the bedroom. So that's the first one embodiment. I have to comment on that. Yes. You just reminded me, I mean, uh, and hopefully it helps some people, right? So uh, that was a big hack for us. And I'd never thought of it as a, like an exercise, but I remember uh, I'm guilty of this, of uh, if you, if Katrina would come into bed, say it's eight, you can get to bed early at eight o'clock, but she asked me a business question mm -hmm. and I can't, I'm, and it takes <laughs> me, well, and really what it is yeah, in listening to you, what I'm okay. connecting is that it really, it takes me out of being present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I instantly am now here and thinking of all the stress of work, this and that. And it's like, I don't care if I was super in the mood right yes. before that. I cannot help it. I am now, I'm somewhere else. You're like else. running numbers. You're pulling out the spreadsheet. You're like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah, what, What's cool about, about that is you, I feel like you just gave me some tools mm. that if and when that happens. You just because, remind yourself. Yeah, because like, yeah. we've we've disciplined ourselves to like, what she knows, like, do not ask me a work question <laughs> yeah. when we go in that bedroom <laughs> or else she's definitely not thing. getting sex. So she, she knows better for the most part, but I'm sure there's going to be a time again where that accidentally happens. And so a great exercise you're saying mm -hmm. would be for me to get reconnected. Is exactly, to, to know, touch breathe you could smell. do it together i oh, yeah cool. no and i also so another thing happens because again this happens to me this happens to everybody i for nothing is breath so does my partner and i will sit and we'll breathe i'm like and he knows because he, he i mean we've been together he sees the book he knows what i do and he's like should we breathe for a minute sometimes when i'm not present i'm like or like the sex will start i don't know if you guys could relate to this and then i'm like oh my God, I wasn't even ready yet. Or how did this, how am I naked already? Like I it's moving too fast or I just didn't do it. And I'm not present. Mm -hmm. I'll step. He's like, should we breathe for a minute? And it's like, it's so anchoring to sit and just to like look into my partner's eyes and we'll take like a few deep breaths mm -hmm. and we breathe together. It resets everything. 
you know, same thing with exercise, right? And you're breathing and you're focused. You could be more embodied. That's one thing. And it, that just helps us. And sometimes even in the middle of sex, if you don't have time to run through the five senses, just breathe, just breathe deeply. And then another great hack for this is to like breathe into your pelvic floor and do like a kegel, mm. a quick tense of your, because that's where all your sexual energy is anyway. And so it just helps you connect to your body, to your sexual energy. That's where the orgasm is going to happen. So all these things really anchor. So that's embodiment is just one of the pillars. Like, am I embodied either in, you know, in life and throughout the day? Do I try to like be embodied and be present? I just think we all know about mindfulness and how important it is. I just think it's a great tool. Like, am I more embodied than not? So that's the first pillar of it. Um, I'm so glad that was helpful. The second one is health. <laughs> now, this is crazy. And the reason why I think this might be obvious, to, you know, to some people, but I can't tell you how many were like, I can't orgasm. I can't get erection. I'll say, well, are you on any, any medication? Oh yeah, I'm on antidepressants. Yeah. I'm on blood pressure med medication. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't do a great job of telling people when they start taking medication mm -hmm. what the side effects are, or we don't listen. But if you have been on the birth control pill, you're on an antidepressant, an SSRI, it's going to impact, it could impact your ability to have an orgasm to stay hard and stay erect. So that's just one example of, of health. Um, and you're moving your body. Are you exercising? Is there blood flow that's going to help with erections, arousal, orgasm, um, the foods that you're eating, what you're putting into your body? Again, all of that is a factor. Um, therapy too, that's your mental health and your physical health is the second pillar. Have you been in therapy and dealt with your issues? Whatever they are, your sexual issues, your traumas. You know, I, I, I can't, we don't recommend therapy enough. I think we all need therapy. It is a, I think it's a requirement. It's essentially like getting a second opinion on your life. It's not this thing. I think people still have a stigma around it, but that's the second pillar is your health and wellness. Yeah. How good are you with that? And some days, so well, I'll walk through how to use these in a, in a second, but the third one is, is your self-awareness. And so, uh, or self, self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is about how well do I know myself? Like I know that if it's cold in the house, I'm not going to want to have sex. If I, I haven't, see. so do I know, do I know that certain positions or that I require foreplay before sex is going to happen? Or I know that I need lube or I know like, what have you learned? We all have a sexual history, mm -hmm. whether you've been with three people or 30 people or had sex with someone one time or 10 times you know what you need. Like, you know the bare minimum of what you might need and you might know more than others and hopefully this this will help people do a deeper dive. Like, what do you need? The fourth one is self-acceptance. Do I accept my body where I'm at today? Do I accept my experience? Do I accept just, is it, this is more about confidence. Do I, am I accepting where I'm at today? And then the fifth one, which is a really important one, is collaboration and that's communication. How well do I communicate with my partner about what I need, my desires, my turn-ons? I've got a lot of great tips in the book that walk, walk the, the whole, like I think one of my favorite chapters is the communication chapter because I know how hard it is for people to have conversations about sex. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that nine out of 10 couples have not had healthy, healthy conversations about sex. Like really where they're like, what is my turn ons? What do I need? What's a requirement for me? Or they, maybe they had it once a few years ago. Like I'm saying couples, I want people to have these conversations all the time. Yeah. And yeah. how you work through these pillars is, and we can get into that, but I'll literally do a note in my phone and be like, okay, because I know how important sex is. I'll think, okay, well, where am I at all these today? Okay, well, I didn't work out, so I don't feel as great. Or I haven't talked to my partner about this thing that's been bothering me, so that's going to impact it. So if you look at all of these pillars and you run through them, you can diagnose and you can figure out what's going on with your own body. Yeah, I like so there's it's interesting that you're saying all these because there's things that you can do with your partner that I think together that help tackle some of these mm -hmm. like together. Like yeah. exercising together could be great because it puts you both in your body. There's typically communication. There's a level of vulnerability when you exercise yeah. with someone because you're struggling, you're sweating, you're grunting. So once you get comfortable <laughs> with that, it's like we're already kind of comfortable yeah. with each other. Um, so, and I can see that with massage too, like massaging your partner uh, because massages. you're touching each other, you're in your body. Oh, I'm comfortable now with my body. He's already touching me or she's already touching me. And then you, you know, you're able to, to progress from there. So, and so you're saying, uh, cause you've been doing this for a while. You're obviously our favorite expert on this. You're saying most things you can pretty much boil down to these five. So yeah. if you're having challenges, Look at these five areas. Dive into those five. And right? kind of dive, dive in and see five. which one resonates. Yeah, exactly. Look at mm. your hormones. And 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 it might be, yeah, there might be in all the and some people are like, oh God, all those areas I'm not great at. Like no one's getting all ace, yeah. you know, pluses and all those, but it's just yeah, it's an I area. I would start with the low hanging fruit, by yes. the way. You you mentioned health you know, as trainers, we all notice this. Anybody who's listening as a trainer or coach right now will attest to this. One of the most common uh uh I guess 
pieces of feedback we would get from clients was that that their sex libido and their, sex, yeah. their, their sex life got better yes and we're well, they're just we're just working them out. i was just gonna say i mean obviously we're biased because we're in the health space but i would think that that has to be the the most important or one of yeah, the most important it is because i'm gonna say it is too. okay good because it just feels like that is that there's so many things that could impact that everything from like you said the drugs the hormones the energy level yes. mm -hmm. i mean even how healthy you are will probably affect your self-confidence and that side i feel like if we it's, had to pick one of these five that is probably kind of bleeds into all categories it yeah. does it really does i can't i can't tell you how many times i'm like where are you moving your body are you eating correctly are you yeah lifting weights you're, all the things are so important but if you're not if someone isn't and they haven't moved their body and they haven't it's literally bluff out. like if you it, you're not going to have any energy down there in your in your pelvic area your your penis your vagina like they're just yeah it yeah is and a if huge you're eating factor. bad you're yeah. inflamed your digestion like anybody ever want to have sex when you're you know constipated or no, your, your right. diarrhea like nobody wants to have sex like <laughs> exactly. that exactly so if you, I could I just mean, imagine the health yeah. thing being it's uh, huge it has to be like the but first thing weird step. yeah it's weird that people don't really connect it I mean time they now hopefully that now they will and we're <laughs> teaching a lot of people about. People just think it's sex is sort of this magical, how many people think about it is like this, I don't really know how it works, but like, I'm just going to close my eyes, hope for the best. Right. But it's mm. all related. I, I, I think it's because we all know how good it feels. So we just assume that it should be so easy because, it, and both people should want it all the time because it's like, oh, we all know that if you've experienced sex that, you know, it's a good feeling. Right. How, do, how about this? Only, cause you, you mentioned like how comfortable you are in your own body. And a lot of people feel shame about their body or maybe they hate, hate their body. We deal with this a lot in the fitness and health space. Yeah. Part of it is we tend to consciously or subconsciously compare ourselves to um, the, you know, the, the super rare, perfect bodies on social media without realizing it. We scroll through, we look at them. We can't help but make ourselves, you know, compare ourselves and say, I don't look like that. And mm -hmm. my partner might want that. And I don't, and so then I don't want to get naked and, oh no, he's going to see me in this particular way or she's going to see me in this particular way in the light. Um, do you ever recommend to people like get off yes. social media and stop looking at the, cause it's making you feel bad about yourself or comparing yourself in unrealistic ways? Often. Yes. Compare and despair is just so detrimental. Um, it's yeah. Get and start following sex positive accounts, things that make you feel good bodies mm -hmm. that make you feel good. I think it's so healthy. It's just, if someone's not making you feel good, unfollow them right now, like pick up your phone right now. And who's that? When you're looking at an account and something comes up and it makes you go cringe, yeah. just unfollow them. And try to fill your brain, you know, whatever we focus on becomes our reality. So if you can start to focus on things that make you feel good, and I have a lot of also exercises in the book about um, how to do this, like really like mirroring exercises where you're looking at your body in the mirror and you're looking at the things that you actually do like and appreciate about your body. I mean, mm. you have to get comfortable with your own body naked because if you're not comfortable with yourself naked, how are you going to feel comfortable naked with anybody else? This body hate thing, body disgust, I mean, it's just, it doesn't, it does not work with sex. Okay. And also like it's, um, and even if getting people, I'm not saying you have to love your body, but what I try to get people to is a body neutrality. At least you're neutral. If you're just neutral, you're like, I accept my body. It's just, it's going to help you so much in the bedroom, feel connected to your sexuality. Cause then you realize like we all just have these bodies and really like so much of sex is your, is your brain and your body connection and so if you can start just thinking thoughts that are going to make you feel feel better about it and removing things like negative you know negative accounts or people that make you feel bad then that's this is really going to help yeah. you and people who deprive themselves or you <clears throat> see bodies that you think are you know a lot of people who are who are depriving or not eating or maybe they're really like thin or whatever you are aspirational i see people who are depriving themselves like deprivation does not lead to desire, like strong sexual desire. Emily, the most ripped, we know this because this is our space. Yeah. I tell people this, the most ripped, like fake, whatever, you know, you look at them on, on Instagram, they have terrible libidos. Yes, because exactly. They're overworked, they don't eat, they are body obsessed. Body obsession does not lead and to insecure. Body about their obsession bodies, does even not they lead look to amazing. body. It's a great sex. No, no. And body obsession r is rampant in the health and fitness space. Oh my God, it yeah. really is. And so, a lot of the people that communicate health and fitness are body obsessed. So I, I want to stay on the, the five pillars. I have some questions. Yes. Like I'm trying to relate it to fitness, like how I would coach somebody in fitness. So let's say you have these five pillars and let's say there's, uh, you know, you kind of assess all of them. Would you coach somebody to look at it like, um, oh man, this is the one I'm really bad at. So I need to address that. Or here's an one that um, I could be better at, but I already kind of get it. And would you tell someone to lean into something that they can move the needle the most? I guess the way I'm, yeah. way I'm trying to word this the best I can mm -hmm. is like, 
I've recognized in myself that uh, there's been times in my life, for sure, I know that when I'm in the best shape, I feel super confident. We have this great sex. But then I've also recognized other times where I'm like, man, I wasn't even in very good shape. We're having some of the most amazing sex. But I would attribute that to the other, because the other pillars were going so good. Yes. Communication is going, that it overpowered the insecure mm -hmm. body feeling that maybe I've had in the past. So knowing that about myself, would, would you coach someone to lean in to what they're already doing well and be great at it or look at the things that you're terrible at and try and address that? Uh, I think it depends on the person, but I think it's really good to like lean into what's easy for you and definitely right. do more of mm -hmm. that. But also like, what is your, I, cause I think it all matters. Like if you're like, well, I'm just going to keep working out cause that's where I feel good. I'm going to do more weights and I'm going to do more supplements. And I'm going to feel a lot better, but you but but as you're doing that, you're spending more time at the gym, more time working out, and you're yep. loving your body. But you have not collaborated with your partner at all. Right. You haven't told them what your desires are. You haven't let them know that you you need sex in a certain way or you want to try things new. That That is going to be detrimental. So I think you kind of have to look at all of them, lay them out, and kind of do a little bit. And I'm not even going to say every day because that's so hard. We like do this every day. But yeah. kind of like look at your week and say – because another thing about this this book is like it's also about pleasure. Mm. And I think in pleasure, not just in the sex realm, but pleasure just in life. Like, what are you doing that makes you feel that that is good for you? And we're so, we put pleasure on conditions. Like I only can have, you know, um, go do whatever your pleasure thing. Like have dessert if I work out, or I can only go see a friend or do this thing that makes me feel good if I check these 10 things off my list. But pleasure is productive. Pleasure is gonna, pleasure is presence and pleasure is gonna help us feel better about every area in our life. So if you can kind of look at some of these things and say like, I guess my point of that is that when we say we're gonna do something every day, that's really hard. But can we look at some of these areas and be like, what could I do more of in my life? What could I program in my life and look at overall that would, if I look at the week, right? Not every day, but okay. So like I look at the pillar and I look like, what can I do that's fun? I haven't talked to my partner in a while. Maybe we need a date night because I think you were mentioning date night earlier, Justin, that it's like, it's so true that date night, there have been studies that show that couples who have date night once a week as a non-negotiable have much healthier, stronger relationships. Mm -hmm. So maybe you say on your date night, then I'm going to try to work and find something that's pleasurable. And I haven't been great at collaboration, communication. I'm going to plan the date night. And then when we're doing that, that's something that I already love and that feels good. I'm going to do the yes, no, maybe less on that date night. That's going to mm. be a little something different. I'm yep. going to continue to work out. I'm going to continue to start to work on some of my self-confidence stuff, but that well. So you can kind of work it into other areas of your life because I do not want this to become another chore, another burden for people. I want this to be like fun because sex is fun. Yeah. Remember when sex was fun and yeah. pleasurable and enjoyable? Yeah. Like, what the fuck happened? Yeah. Ah. That's actually yeah. All right, so you know, you had you had written down some 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 notes for us to kind of ask you on. And one of the things that stood out to me, well, there were a couple of things that stood out to me. Uh, one of them was that you wanted to rebrand anal sex. Yes. Now, now, first off, I think that that has become, I read some statistics on that. That has become much more normalized over the last couple of decades, probably due to pornography, I would yeah. assume. Okay, so- what do you mean by rebrand? Like, what's going on there? Oh my god! Right. <laughs> because, because I think they get such a bad rap. Okay, okay, so so it's aspirational. People love it. It's taboo. Definitely, since porn, it's become much more you know ubiquitous, and everyone wants to talk about it. But I think that it gets a bad rap because it's so like we feel like it could be such a. Um, uh, that it is taboo, it's wrong, we have shame around it, you know, the anus is just for exiting, or it's dirty, or, you know, there's certain women I know who think like, oh, well, I'm gonna, you know, once I'm married, or I guess I'll let my partner do it then, but it's for his pleasure. I'm talking about heterosexual couples oh, right see. now, okay? So there's all these conditions and all these ideas we have around sex. It's um, it's dirty, it's wrong, it's sh sh um, shameful and taboo, but I want to rebrand it and say, well, wait a minute, we all have anuses, we all have assholes, or however you want to say it, we do, and it's packed with nerve endings. And it can feel really, like all of sex is nerve endings. All of sex is literally stimulated, finding the best and most efficient way to stimulate all these feel good nerve endings in our bodies. That's not, that, it's blood flow and nerve endings. At the end of the day, those are my best, like understand that. So if that's true, and I'm telling you that it is, what if we figure out the best way to have anal play? It doesn't have to be anal sex, but, and, and I have a lot of great, you know, tips on this, but really most of us are doing it wrong. So hmm. maybe we had anal and it was like the partner put it in without lube because one of my top tips is Ouch. lube, mm. lube, go slow and breathe. But if it was just like a drunken night or it was the wrong hole because you thought it was something, <laughs> we've had bad experiences. We're like, oops, wrong this hole. You're like, oh no, that's, you know, never again. Yeah. I'm never going to do it again. But if you mindfully play, starting with like maybe you know a finger and you explore 
and you're with a trusted partner and you feel safe and you learn to empty your bowels because yes, it can be messy, but like most of us know the right way to have it, you know, know when we're going to have to go to the bathroom or not. And just, you just can kind of troubleshoot it. I've actually found that when people take this into consideration and re-examine their relationship to anal, they actually have a really good time. Mm. <laughs> they like it and it feels good. You know, not for everybody, but again, nothing is for everybody. No yeah. sex act for everybody, but I tell people to like rethink whatever they believe to be true about sex and kind of turn it on its head and go, do I still believe that? Is that still true? What else can I learn here? There was a study that came out, I want to say five years ago, that kind of made mainstream a little bit on that. And it said something like women who have anal sex are, I don't remember how many times more likely to orgasm than women who don't. I don't know if you oh, read that or not, but no. the speculation was that wasn't necessarily the anal sex, but rather that they were more open to doing more things yeah. and just more relaxed. And therefore that led more to- That makes sense. Yeah. I can see that. It was more the psychological that. aspect of it. Yeah. Than, I mean, you could anything. also have like indirect stimulation to the to the, to the the G-spot through anal sex. So that can also help. But I could see someone who's just like open in their bodies. There's again, the more nerve endings we're going to stimulate, the more potential for orgasm and pleasure. Mm. And like your nipples too. Like there's like nipple, nipples are related to the same regions of the brain that are stimulated. The clitoris and the nipples- are both activate the same regions of the brain for orgasm, like the anus, like we're, it's all related, even like our anus and our, our clitoris or our penis and our ball, like it's all, it's like we separate it all because of, you know, religion and society. We've had to like chop it up or anal sex just means you're gay if you're a man, which, you know, it's who you're having sex with might decide that you're gay, not that you want to feel good with these right, stimulants. Right. So, okay. so I think that's what's really fun to kind of, that's why I spend so much time too in the book talking about shame and, you know, I think early on in the book, I'm like, I know you want my anal sex tips, but first let's talk about sh shame. <laughs> because if we can get rid of the shame and yeah. the trauma and the stress, then we're all going to have a really good time here. Well, how, what, what is that process? What's the like? rebrand Ob called? Obviously. What did you say? So what's the rebrand called? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah we're going to yeah. call it instead. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think the word- I think Home away from home? <laughs> <laughs> the other one. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the, yeah. Walking in through the back door. Uh, booty, I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> I jacked you. Yeah, no. yeah. 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 Justin was brilliant. Who's my train of thought? Yeah. Now, now all I can do is titles right now. <laughs> you know, uh, I think yeah. it's all uh, <laughs> The other white meat. You know? No, where I was going was that. The other white meat. Uh, obviously, oh, you would recommend uh, probably if someone's got a lot of trauma slash shame over something, I think the, the default is therapy and work through that. If maybe uh, you've already done some therapy, are there things that that person or exercises or things that you would recommend outside of the obvious therapy? like For shame? Yeah, shame. And for stress and trauma and shame. I think first it's examining your where your beliefs about sex come from. So, okay. So I, I love this question because like, think about it right now. Like, is there anything that you think about sex and you think, oh God, I could never do that. Like that's, that would be wrong. Like, sure. you know, I think anal too. So be like, oh God, it's just for exiting or that makes me dirty. Well, then, then you get to go, this is the exercise. Where does that come from? Huh. Where where did that come? Oh, okay. That's right. Someone shamed me for that in high school. Like we all have different sources or the, the you know, in church or um, my parents or someone, I'm afraid someone's going to judge me. And then you get to go, oh, that's the source. That's not me. That's not mine. Someone implanted that into my brain. I get to separate from that. That's not mine. Well, how do I want to rebrand that? Like, what do I want to believe? What do I want to believe? And you could write affirmations. Like, I believe that my body is ready and deserving of pleasure at all times. I get to figure out what feels good to me. I'm in charge of my own pleasure. Like, all of these things, like affirmations, mirroring, like looking at, you know, and just kind of rebrand, re relearning and unlearning. Unlearning all the harmful messages around sex because really what is messing us up is that we don't feel safe talking about it. There's been so much judgment around it that we just are like in these like, sexual straight jackets. And I just want people to like remove that. And that's part of it with shame. So what is the source of the shame? Removing it and then replacing it. Like reading, listening to sex positive voices, images, and just kind of like, yeah, unlearning and then relearning. What are great ways to open up conversations like that with your partner? Because I know there's a lot of people listening who are like, oh gosh, you know, there's this, I have these, this desire or I like these things, but I don't know if I could tell my partner. It's kind of embarrassing. Okay. Are they going to judge me? What's this going to mean? Um, what are great ways to open, I guess, conversations? And also, there's what's the difference between fantasy and real life? Because I think a lot of people have, okay. they think if I say this, then they think I really want this, but uh -huh. it's really just a fantasy. Oh, these are such good questions. Mm. Okay, so, well, first let's do that. And then I'm going to come back to the compliment sandwich. So that's the, that's my great, okay. I love, the that's like a great way to communicate. But let's first talk about the difference between fa fantasies. Mm -hmm. There's two kinds of fantasies. There's the fantasies that you want to happen 
They're like, I think it would be so hot if you tied me up. We talked dirty. We had a threesome. Like, that has got to happen. And then there's the ones that we just want to keep to ourselves. There's the ones that we just like to think about or the ones that we want to share but we don't really want it to happen. But we're like, I think this would, this is what turns me on. Maybe we could like dirty talk it. But mostly, I guess, let me make that clear. There's the ones that we want to happen and the ones we don't want to happen. Mm-hmm. We just want to think about them. And it's okay to keep things to your, yourself too. You don't have to share every thought with your partner, okay? It's okay that you fantasize about an ex. I'm going to make people feel a lot better now. It's okay that you fantasize about an ex. It's okay that you fantasize about that hot person you just saw on the street. Like, that's all okay. You don't need to share that with your partner. But then there's the ones that you do want to happen, okay? That you there's the ones that you're like, God, I can't stop thinking about you in latex, or I can't stop thinking about you having sex with somebody else. So those those are the differences with fantasies. Okay. And um, how does someone know the difference of that, right? So I think that's a, a, a another, it's a great question. Yeah, because I've, I've heard people like I, you know I have people where they'll have a fantasy, but then they're then then themselves will be like, oh my God, does that mean that that, that I really want that in real life? Because I really really want that in real life, you know, like things like where sex is maybe more rough or public and they think, well, I wouldn't want to really do that in real life, but why do I find that as a, you know, as a turn on type of deal? Yeah. Well, I think that that's a great question. I think you have to do some investigating. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to bring, I'm going to talk about threesomes because that's probably the number one fantasy for everyone, for men and for women. So let's say you're like, I don't know if I want to actually have one. I like to think about it. I think it's really hot. So, and you could fill in the blank here with rough sex or dirty talk. You think it's hot. This, this will work for any of that. Watch some porn with it with your partner and like just, you know, and then I'll get to how the conversation about this first because they're like, but I've never even watched porn with my partner. But let's say you you turn porn and be like, okay, I'm I'm picturing the threesome happening. I'm watching it with my partner. Would I actually want this to happen? Then you could even take that in the bedroom. You could dirty talk it. You could like roll, like work it out, like workshop it. Mm. Like right now I'm picturing somebody like going down on you or you're with somebody else. How does it actually make you feel in the moment? Like that's a great way to test if it's something you actually want want to happen is by like bringing it close to the bedroom, like through porn or through dirty talk. And then you get to kind of test like, again, embodied, be in your body. Like, how did that make me feel? Did it make me like tense? Did it make me more open? Like what, what did it make me feel? So I think that's a great way to test it. And again, if you're in a relationship with somebody where you feel safe. And again, this whole talking about sex thing becomes a lot easier over time. You will get this comfortable talking about sex. Like you're talking about the weather, like overcast with a chance of orgasms today. It will become (laughs) just as easy and normalized. So that's one thing. I think that's how you know. And again, if you're with a partner that's safe, like again, with my partner, we talk about all of it, it gets normal. It just becomes like, and again, I know people are like, well, that's you, but yeah, but it wasn't always like that with all my other partners. Like I had to learn too and find someone who's comfortable with it that we just sort of talk about things. Like I thought I wanted that and now I don't. Guess we got to reroute and find other things. There are endless things that you can do in a relationship. So it's okay if you try something out, but it's not what you want, you know? So mm-hmm. what, that- And you brought up the compliment sandwich or how to bring it yes. up. Tell me about that. Okay, so here's a compliment sandwich. Because this is a great way. So let's say you've never talked about sex with your partner, but there's something that you were like, I just, I don't know. I want, I really want, what would be a good thing here? Is there something you guys hear? Like um, maybe it could be mutual masturbation. Maybe you're like, I really want to. Try this, yeah. Try this. So compliment sandwich. You start with something that you love about your relationship, your sex life. You start with something like, oh God, I I, I can't stop thinking about how hot it was Um Last night when we had sex, I loved the way you were going down on me. I feel like you were doing all those things. That was that was such a hot way to like come have an orgasm or something. Compliment something that just happened or something that you love about your sex life. And then this is like the second part is where you bring in something that you'd like to happen. You know, something that you constructive something that you want something that you want to try. She said, "You know what?" And I was just listening to Mind Pump. I was listening to this podcast. I was listening to Sex with Emily, and they were talking about mutual masturbation. I think that would be so hot for us. Like I, I feel like when we are, so let me connect this. So you're going down to me and I realized it felt really good. And I, there was this part of me that it was sort of stimulated by your tongue and your fingers. I think it'd be really hot to try mutual masturbation together because I would love to use my toy and kind of explore this area. And I'd love to see you masturbate because I realized I've never seen that. And I think it'd be, you know, just so hot for us to do it together And then you end with, so that's like your request. That's like how you're requesting something. And then you end it with, because I think the more we experiment with things together and we try new things, it's going to make our sex life even hotter, Mm. even better. So you kind of, the first piece of bread is like something that you love. Then the request or the suggestion, 
And then you're like, why it's good for both of you. You could plug threesome into that. I think it was so hot, you know, watching that, whatever. Like usually threesomes come up. I don't know. This is, you could be like, I think it, I don't know. Threesomes is a tough one to work in here if you've never talked about sex. But again, <laughs> that's a tough one to work in. But anything is it's possible. Stuff. Yeah. Don't yeah. start with threesome, but just talk about fantasies. What are the three most memorable times you've had sex? That's a great conversation starter with your yeah. partner. I, I think the big challenge too is with couples is that you know, for the other person listening, that it may make them feel like they're not enough then for you. Or does that mean that you don't want me or you want this other thing. The threesome thing. Yeah. Any, any, com any conversation. A lot of these conversations, That's right? That's true. Yeah. And so this is where it takes a lot of, and, and this is why I spend so much time on this on my show and in the book is like, when we bring up sex to our partners, since none of us do it, like we talk about health and nutrition way more easily. Like, oh, I've been wanting to lose some weight or I got to right. start working out. That's totally normalized. But the second you say to your partner, let's talk about sex. I'm going to guarantee, I'm going to say that most likely they're going to go into fight or flight. Sure. They're going to be like, holy shit, I'm not a good lover. My penis is as bad as I thought it was or as small or, you know, like the, I'm fat. Whatever you think of, we go to the terrible, terrible place because it's not normal. Because we're like, if you're bringing up a suggestion, it must mean that I am a horrible person, a horrible lover. So this is where you say, no, you have to say, you know, I'm bringing this up. I realized we haven't talked about sex a lot. So this is how I encourage everyone to have these, even if you're not ready for the compliment sandwich, you say to your partner tonight, many people you say, and again, there's time to do this. So maybe it's not tonight if you don't have time, but maybe it's your next date night. And you say, I realize, and I want you to say, because you're listening to this podcast, it's a great way to give fodder, that we haven't talked about our sex life very much. And I've heard that couples that talk about their sex life have a lot healthier sex. And I know that we kind of talk about it here and there, but I wonder if you'd be open to adopting a new a new practice of talking about our sex life. And then your partner might say, well, what's wrong? What'd you hear? What'd you think? What do you want? <laughs> that, that, that will happen. No, I'm telling you, I thought you might react that way. And they actually told me that. I got to troubleshoot for this. I've never done this either. I, I want to learn to be great communicators with each other. Because I think we can both agree, babe, we want to be great lovers to each other. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Well, apparently the way to do that is to communicate about sex and to be really honest and open. And I don't think we've done that. I don't even really know what it means yet, but would you be open to talking about it? And then just keep saying like, I. and then if they're not, no. Couples who talk about sex being the sex life is over, I would listen to that. And I wouldn't continue to put, remember, it's not a one-time conversation. You can listen to that and say, okay, seems like a lot to come up for you here. And then you can bring it up again. I am. I imagine there's a, a a table conversations around this, right? So the table conversations that I told you that we use is like mm -hmm. all kinds of random stuff. It has nothing to do with sex, but yeah. it leads to that many times, right? Because it's just having good conversation. But I bet Doug, if you were to Google like table conversations that are adult or a set, I was just going to say this is a great hack because it takes the pressure off each other right. to talk about yeah, it. And it's just yes. random you draw a random that, card that says that's why I love that yeah the cards are great the yes no maybe list is great. I love that because it takes yeah, the, the pressure off and too. it's like I didn't bring it up but here yeah. it is on the list yeah. what do you think about exactly. this exactly I have a list of like 69 questions in the book okay. <laughs> conveniently <laughs> interesting <Yeah. laughs> conveniently 69 number. I don't yeah. know I was like I have so many I'm like I'm gonna make 69 and they're questions like that like what's our biggest what's your biggest turn on like what's yeah. what's the number one most time most you know what's your favorite part of your body what's your on your sexual bucket list you know there's 60 it was open to that page, like skip around and be like, have dinner that night and have a glass of wine and be like, yeah. let's do that. Because what I try to do is I, I try to give people these tips because I know how hard it is. So there's like a whole, there's a whole slew of different exercises that you can do, but yes, picking up the cards is an awesome way to do that. That's awesome. Um, I, you know, I, again, you're such a great person to ask because you've been working with people on this for so long. Do you find common questions among younger couples versus older couples, or is it is it all kind of similar? It's all the same. No, it's all the same. Yeah. It's all the same. It's how do we keep it interesting? How do we keep it fresh? How do we make time for it? How do we keep, you know, yeah, like how do we get our desire up? Or why don't I, you know, maybe when you're a little bit older, there's more questions about like, you know, desire or wetness or arousal mm -hmm. or Stuff well, like in that, that vein, what about things that you've seen? Because like us, you've been doing your profession for a very long time. And, you know, I definitely see things different today that are challenged, challenges for people getting in shape and being healthy than the, what I saw 20 years mm -hmm. ago. Has that evolved and changed? Yeah. Tell that, me I'd be about. interested to know what it is in, in fitness, too. That's so interesting. But I would say that porn is one of them. Yeah, porn is a huge be. factor. Yeah. Uh, social media. 
So whether it's just flirting online or seeing your partner on Instagram and liking other photos and like, I think there's always been jealousy since the beginning of time, but that is sort of kind of- The accessibility now is just so crazy. Exactly. It's so accessible. Um, But when it comes to sex specifically, I would say, um, I don't know. I think probably porn, there's a lot more sex toys. I think, well, the good things is there's more sex toys and they're more accessible now and they're body safe. They're not like- all look like penises. Like that's the other thing. Most sex toys could fit in the palm of your hand and they're literally just little vibration machines that mm. feel really great on nerve endings. So they're not as t- as, as uh, intimidating. Titula- intimidating. They're just as titillating, not as intimidating. I'm trying to think of what <laughs> else. What else is the, is the other thing? I think maybe dating apps with cheating, but I'm, I don't know about sexually what has oh, really let's, changed. Let's talk about dating apps. So I, I saw, um, kind of forget who talked about this. Uh, our buddy, Chris Williamson, had somebody on the show that, that talked about um, how bad dating apps actually have been for partnering up and stuff. And, you know, they, they're touted as amazing. You know, one in one in four couples meet online now. And, the, and so we've pushed these dating apps so hard. But what we're starting to find is it's starting to, I don't know, cattle like a, a, per, a small percentage are getting now a ton of, of ton of access and people. And then a lot of people getting are, ignored. are getting ignored, mm-hmm. which is. Yeah probably not good for us. I mean, what are your thoughts on, on dating apps and where they're going? I mean, I can obviously, we, we can, we can, we've already heard all the good cases, you know, somebody couldn't find somebody. Oh, we met online. We're across the world. Now we were yeah. in love and we're married, but not a lot of conversation around the negative things around that. Mm-hmm. What, what are your thoughts? around? Yeah. It? You know, I think that, so you're saying like the algorithms when these people just aren't getting picked and they're not getting any feedback on the apps. That's yeah, well, cool. so what they find is that like, uh, that like the top 5% of men, are getting like 80% yes. of the activity and then like the, the top 1% get like all of it. And every other guy in, yeah. gets no, like he gets ignored or whatever, because it, I mean, it, mir- it mirrors a real world where, mm-hmm. you know, men have to ask exactly. for women and women tend to be the ones that turn down. Um, but now it's like, it's yeah, just that's amplified just a, it. Yeah. That, I could see that. I could see, I, and I have heard some of this too, statistically speaking, um, that, that it is harder for people. Well, first I would say that, there's a lot of dating apps out there. Mm-hmm. So if you're on like Tinder or Bumble, like those are the most popular ones. So maybe find a more like niche app. And then- That's um, a great one. Yeah. yeah. There's like, there are, because they're out there. There's so many. There's there's so many different ones you could find. Yeah. Um, Farmers only. Basically, what did you say? <laughs> farmers For, only. Exactly. Yeah, farmer, I was going to say that. We love that example, but it is true. There's like apps for farmers. There's app. There's like meetups, okay? So you're going to think this is funny. A meetup's been around forever. There's different things that you can do. Like if you like to hike or you like to ride horses or you like to, you know, whatever, you're cowboys or you're like to clowns. cook. You right. could go, you could clowns. You could find and meet up in your area tonight. Just go like meetup.com or meetup.org and you could find something happening where you're going to meet people in real life who are sharing a common thing that you that you like to do as that's well. That's a good hack I think to that's me. That's a really, that, to me, Get that's out a, there. That's really yeah. smart. Instead of like being so- uh, Isolated. Yeah, yeah. or isolate like, ourselves. oh, this has to be this formal day. It's like, instead, I'm just going to put myself in places with people that have things in that's common it. with me and then hopefully I meet And then start there. talking to them. Exactly. And start talking to people. I think we all have to practice it again too. I think a lot of us- just it's not as easy socializing anymore, or maybe we never did if we grew up with like our phone, or you know, everything's not done online now. So I think it is a practice. Like we need connection and we need intimacy. We require that. And another hack is like another thing is to do is like say yes to things. Say yes to those events that you wouldn't like your your neighbor down the street having a barbecue. You don't love the neighbor, but they might have some friends that you like. Mm-hmm. Or someone invites you to, you know, whatever those invites you get, or you see something on Instagram and you're like, oh, you know, or TikTok, you're like, you know, they will show you things in your area. Like look up things happening in your area. And go to it. Go to one thing a month or one thing a week that you wouldn't normally do because people are out there. There are more single people than ever and start practicing, yeah, start would, talking to people. I would have to say, I mean, I would think that uh, those are the two biggest things, pornography and isolation. Pornography yes. because um, you have uh, just this over, like this, this, this dopamine hits and you're becoming desensitized. You have these unrealistic expectations, maybe not as motivated to go meet anybody and talk to anybody because you're just, you know, at home by yourself. Then the isolation, like I'm not around other people um, mm-hmm. and it's easy to stay isolated. I could order food. I could stream movies. Exactly. I don't have to leave. You used to have to leave when we, when I was younger. Exactly. It's like, you got to leave your house because you can't get food otherwise. Or you exactly. can't do certain things. So you're forced to be out and meet with people. So yeah. I think those are probably the two biggest things because they're showing now that 
younger people having less sex than ever. Exactly. Yeah. I think it is loneliness and I think it's the apps, everything's delivered. We're literally not interacting with people anymore. Yeah. We are not. And I think those are the two things and we we need it. We require it. It feels better to go out and, and meet people and to, you know, and I think that we've, you know, forgotten to do that. But there are still people out in the world. Like they still want to meet you. They do. So I think then, yeah, taking yourself off yeah. the apps, taking classes. I think and I think are- trying to avoid the awkward, you know, kind of like scary parts of meeting people. Like we're trying to avoid that, but I feel like that's that's kind of like a necessary part of, of life. It is. And it's also like, I don't know, confident building mm-hmm. and a turn on when you the go out you, and you, you know, get over that. I think mm-hmm. that we forget how good it feels for connection. I think there was something else too. It's something I was just reading about. Same thing about how we, I think it was on our weak ties. It might've been something, but like, you know, the, the weak ties, like the people that you see every day at the coffee shop or the people you see yeah. at the dog park. Those, those are like, uh, they show that the people, the more weak ties someone has, it's a silly name for it because it doesn't sound important, but they say that it's an indicator of more, of more happiness, contentment, mm. just like having people in your circle, getting out of your house, like waving hi to your neighbors or knowing somebody like at your class or at your gym, those people are actually contributing to our happiness and our overall well being. And the weak ties really suffered, you know, the last few years. Well, isn't it, so isn't it true you can't, we, when we are online and communicating, you can get the adrenaline, the endorphin, things like that, but we miss. You miss oxytocin, the oxytocin. oxytocin. Yes, unless you're you in person exactly right. which is the feel good hormone mm-hmm. right? that's feel good the cuddle yeah. hormone the body the bonding mm-hmm. hormone right so I mean which you would think is a yeah. very important key it's to really having important. a healthy you, relationship well, good when sex you touch and connection and the best pickup if you guys are nervous about this like the best pickup line ever and way to connect is say hi just like hey yeah. how's your day how's hi. it going I mean that literally is the best right when you look someone says hi to you What's or how's your, your day yeah yeah Wait, Oh, good. Simple. How are you? I mean, great. How's it going? Have you been here before? What's you, that like? Well, you, know, you know, the other thing too, Emily, so I remember when I first uh, like fell in love with my wife, uh, like I just loved like the smell of her skin and just being around her. And there's lots of things that we haven't yet quantified. I mean, we could talk about pheromones. Yeah. And, I mean, there's studies that show that women can smell a shirt yes. that a man wore and identify whether or not they'd find him attractive with like 80% accuracy. Yes. Some of these studies mm-hmm. show. If you do everything digitally, you are eliminating that part that's this kind of un- subconscious, like, you know, our DNA's matching desire type thing. And you're just like basing it off their picture, right. how much they earn, what they do for a living, exactly. what they like. And it's like ordering so off a menu. Cues and body language. Yeah, 70% uh, of indicators. our communication is body language. Yeah. yeah. yeah so. And it's, it seems like the same thing with fitness too, that we'll see like people avoiding these big compound lifts. And, you know, this is something yeah. that we're always trying to sell is like the, one of the most effective ways for you to, you know, achieve a lot of your goals. And But it's hard work and it's, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. And it's like, there's a learning curve to it and you're going to suck at it. And it's like mm-hmm. the same thing. If I'm trying to meet somebody in person, it's, you're going to stumble a bit. Like it's going to, you're going to trip a little, yes. it's going to be kind of awkward, but the more you like face that and, you know, you go through that journey and that process, you get better at it and it, it, it richens that experience. Exactly. It's so, it's so true. I mean, I, I think I definitely had, I mean, I think we all did had less of it the last few years or we've kind of become more isolated, but the more you do it. It's like everything's a muscle. Dating is a muscle. Talking mm-hmm. to people is a muscle. It's a muscle that you have to keep. It's an exercise. It's a yep. habit. You got to keep going. It's like you got to keep working. It. And if you don't do it, it is going to be a little un- uncomfortable and awkward at first. Or if you're just getting out of a relationship and you're newly single, that's also a habit. It's hard to date again, but you got to do it. And everything gets easier over time. Everything's going to be a little less awkward. I have a bit of a controversial question to ask you. Yes. Do you think that this boss bitch movement that's happened in the last, say, two decades? has helped or hurt women as a whole as far as their sex life? Do you think it's helped them get better, more sex, or do you think it has hindered their sex oh life? Oh, my God. That's a great question. How would you define, like, a boss bitch? Somebody who's well, like, this, I, I don't the, need a man? The, the, or... Yeah, the, the woman empowering movement to climb the corporate ladder, make as much or more money as the man, like, be independent. You don't need a man. Like, that That movement has really climbed in the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that it's uh, necessarily bad or good. I'm just curious to if you, since you've been doing this so yes. long, had have noticed that you get a lot of women now in their 30s, 35, 40 years old, super successful, maybe even great looking, got all these things working for them, but not having sex or not finding yeah. a partner. Mm, that's such a guy. I, I hadn't tied it to, to that movement, but I think, I think that it definitely – so – yeah, I mean, I do. I think that women trying to be more like men has been detrimental for our sexuality and polarity. So this is a concept. I don't know if you guys have, have ever covered like pol- sexual polarity on the show. And it's a little bit, people get kind of tripped up with the term masculine and feminine. Sure. 
but we all have masculine and feminine of inside course. of us, right? So we all have a combination of that. But in order for attraction to happen, you need to have someone's leading and someone's following. So traditionally, the masculine is the leader and the feminine is the energy, right? And so, so right now, for example, I'm I'm in my masculine right now. I would say I'm I'm talking, I'm doing my business, and a lot of my day I'm in my. I'm going to give you like a, a real life example to explain this. I'm a masculine, but like. I brought in a business. I got people work for me. I'm doing shit, right? Like the getting shit done. That is the masculine energy. But in order for like sex polarity to happen, you need attraction and you need the opposite. It's like think of like a um like the the plus and minus of a a um magnet. A, a magnet, right? Yeah. So if you've two pluses, two minus, it's not gonna attract, right. but you you need that. So that's what sexual chemistry is. So in order for it to happen, for example, if I have a day at home, I'm just going to give my, where I am working all day and I'm in my, but I want to feel aroused and turned on. I know that I can't, this is what my self-knowledge pillar. I can't go from work to like be turned down with my boyfriend because he is, when, when our sex happens, he is more of the masculine. I'm in the feminine. I'm not necessarily dominating in the bedroom. Sometimes I can, but I'm more of a, I'm more of the, um, of a sub. I think again, you need that in all of sex. You need a dominant sub to, for leading and following. So what I need to do is to get, when I'm in my, and also we work together. Like he's helped me with some business stuff. Like it's a lot of time. And I know that what I need to do is I need to shut my laptop. I need to take a shower. I need to do some breath work. Sometimes I masturbate to get into my body, into my feminine. I need to move my body. I need to dress in something that makes me feel good. Put on like perfume, makeup, get into a, a place where I'm feeling more, in touch with my feminine because that is mm. what I want to bring to the table. And then when I'm more of my feminine, he reacts by being more in his masculine, right? Because he's also has a lot of feminine energy too. Like he's very nurturing and empathic and all these things, but they work together synergistically. So they, then and I do kind of explain this more in the book because, but, but what is happening with this boss bitch movement is that like, I don't need a man, anything, but we're in our, we're getting shit done. And then we, there's no room. There's no room for a guy. If you're again, heterosexual relationship, but again, in, in gay couples and lesbian couples, there's also masculine and feminine energy right. because someone has to always lead and follow. So if you, if you're showing up of like, I got everything done, I, I don't need a man, then, then we all want to feel of use and utility. So then there's no wear for that person. There's no vulnerability. I think what we see with boss bitch in this movement is like, there's no vulnerability. There's no softness. There's no opening for the masculine to come in. So that's kind of how I see it. Does that? Yeah, yeah it does. It? And I think, I think it tends to be generally the, the male, you know, with the masculine, the female with more of the feminine, but it could be either or, right? Yeah. You could have, uh, you know, it'd be different. But like, I find that with, my wife, like I, I find her, m m I mean, some of the biggest turn ons for me with her is when I see her, like I came home the other day from work and she had both the kids and mm -hmm. she was cooking and she yeah. was like nurturing and she was with my son and he was loving on her and holding the baby. And I like, I was like, oh my God, when they go to bed, like it's, this is, it's because <laughs> that for me was such that's a feminine. tremendous. She's and, nurturing, and, she's caretaking, she's empathic. Those yeah. Are, and that for me was huge. That's like yeah. a big deal. And then like there was one time when I did this big sales presentation with a bunch of people and I'm standing, you know, doing my presentation or whatever. She was in the back and afterwards she was like, I'm so turned on by what you were doing exactly. because it was for her, it was that yes. energy, that masculine energy. So that's yeah. it. The reason yeah. why I asked is I, I see actually lots of examples in my own family, in my circles and friends it, with the women in there that are actually are very strong, uh, independent, kind of have that, that boss bitch energy. And what I find it, and they, they're challenged in the relationship and sex department. Yeah. And what I see is that, they have this really high masculine energy, but yet they're also physically attracted to a a that masculine inger, energy. And okay. I feel like if you're if you're a, a female and you have that much masculine energy, it, you're you're probably most likely going to need a, a partner who has a lot of feminine energy to probably match mm -hmm. really well. But they don't want that. They don't want the the beta dude or the guy right. that's not a go getter. So it's like they they have all this masculine energy, but then they also want someone at their level or higher. And I think it just it just shrinks their That's, dating. Yeah, I could totally see that. And what I would say to these women is that I would I see them as being really disconnected and not embodied at all and not in touch with their sexual energy and not in touch with who they are and what they want. And, you know, when we start to, you know, sex begets sex. So the more we get to like cultivate our sexual energy, like I think that it's really hard to be in your in your masculine all day long. And, you know, I would ask, like, how often are these women, like, moving their body? Are they dancing? Are they masturbating? Are they in touch with their, their whatever makes them feel feminine? 
And I think that that's what is attractive to the more like alpha types that you're talking about. But yeah. they're, there's no, they're not showing any of that. They're going to dinner and they're interviewing the guy like on their date. They're like putting it out there. Like, what right. are you going to do for me? What are you going to do for me? But someone, pre- and again, this is all generalization stereotyping. Sure. But if you're in that masculine, you're not going to see where you, where, it doesn't mean in softness and vulnerability is not weakness. So I oh, think for okay. these women, right. they do, like this is a, like I, I've been there too. I've been places where I'm so in my thing and I'm not, and I have not softened that either. So I've had to learn this as well of like allowing someone to, to care, to care for me and to show my vulnerability. And so that's a practice because I think that being tough and being out there, it's like, it's not okay. And I think that to find what you want, you have to learn to be more in touch with your. Yeah. I find that you would be a great, you're a great example of this. Cause I, th- I think of you a bit as a kind of a boss bitch chick. You have yeah. all these things going for you like that. Very independent, probably necessarily don't need a man financially and no, things like right. that. So how has that been in your life? Do you typically, uh, are the men that you date or been with, are they typically very feminine because of that? Or have you been able to navigate that where you know you want this masculine guy, so you know how to make that switch of like, okay, at work, I can be boss bitch, but then also when I transfer over into my relationship, I need to learn to switch over. Like, what is- I I think I've done, I've had both. Yeah, I want to hear- I think I've definitely had both kinds of guys that I've dated- um, I think that I need guys who are very like empathic and vulnerable and maybe they're, they're just in touch with their feminine more so, but I think I've been attracted to all different types, but I also am really vulnerable. Like I always have a lot going on and I've like, I've always need a lot of, I don't know, like certain things are harder for me, like business stuff. So I've also dated guys who are really good at like helping with my business. And so I, you know, it's like my current guy. Um, but I think I've just been in touch. I'm more attracted to the person. I, I guess- I don't know. I want somebody, I don't need somebody to take care of me in the traditional way, but I want somebody who can, I don't know. What am I looking for? I'm looking for, I have you know, seen, have you answer. seen that? I mean, have you had, can you give an example or can you think yeah. of a time where that has like you've, because of your energy, your masculine energy, that it's conflicted with the partner where it's like, you know, because you are that way. And then maybe you get a guy that is a little more alpha or masculine and that is an, an area where you guys conflict because yeah. you have too much masculinity. Yes, absolutely. And then it doesn't really work. But I think it's like nuance because it's like, how do we get together? Like there's sometimes with my partner, like I want him to, I don't know. I mean, it's a really good, I'm trying to think of, it's just a balance, it's all a dance because it's not just about the sex. It's about like, how do we communicate? Mm-hmm. How do we handle different areas of our life? How do we... You know, I think I want somebody who's got his own stuff going on and he's got his own like life. Like I don't want to be the one who's taking care of everything. So I think for me, the ma- a man who's understands his purpose, like the masculine is someone who's got a purpose yeah. and they, they are very purpose driven and they are very like independent and they have their goal setting and they are sort of a, they're structured. And so I'm very attracted to that, even though I have that. So I feel like that is, but then I need to be someone's too much like that. I also need somebody who's has like the em- empathy and the softness too. So I don't know. I guess I've well, had a, a man that's not in touch with this feminine is probably not going to be able to understand yours. Exactly. So that's probably why it's it's so important. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I need someone. I think nowadays too, there's just there's just I don't know. There's just more room and more space. I think for men to really start to to, 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 to feel more and to also own their masculine. But for me personally, I've dated so many, like if you lined up all my boyfriends, they would all be very, very different. Really? Yes. <laughs> I think, cause now I'm thinking about them, but I think my boyfriend now is a little bit more like he's got two daughters. Like he's a little bit more, maybe, I don't know, maybe he's more in his feminine sometimes. And, um, but then when we're both like talking business, like it's so not hot. So then I have to get to more of my feminine when he goes there. Like I, <laughs> cause I see this too. I'm like, Oh God, I've been like such a nightmare lately. I have to really kind of like bring it. And then I try to do my things like I'm going to make dinner or I'm going to like, we're going to go in nature. Or we're going to hike. We're going to, cause that is the feminine. Well, that's what I, I think that's what I'm searching for from you because I think yes. you are such a good example. And I don't necessarily think that like, because you've dated all the spectrum that's it's good or bad or really explains it. It's more like, imagine if you've got those traits and you want a man who has also got some of those masculine traits, there's certain practices that you probably have to put in place. Yeah in order to get that or receive that kind of love uh-huh. from uh, from the type of man that you want. Because yeah. when I think of these friends and, and and family members that come to mind that are like this, they uh, they really struggle. I mean, it's like they get one extreme or the other. They tend to get like, okay, well, 
I have all this masculine energy, so I need to find this like super feminine guy. Then they get this guy that's like super beta. He has no purpose. He's not driven. He's like, he, oh, I'll be a stay at home dad. I got no problem with it. And it's like, she's like, that's oh God, I don't want that. You know, I want a guy that's at my level and pushing me. But it's like, okay, well, then you get that guy. And that guy's very purpose driven. He's a leader. He wants to run the house. He wants to run the show. It's like, and you're definitely not that chick. So like, how does that- They need to, I would tell these women that they are so in their masculine. They need to just do some work cultivating their feminine. Hmm. They need to- Turn off their, you know, turn off their phones, take some more time off work, go do like a yoga retreat, spend time in the ocean, in nature, cooking, getting back to themselves, masturbating. I'm telling you, like self love, <laughs> taking baths. Um, these are all the ways, like getting really going on a women's retreat. But honestly, doing those things and, and and sustaining it, not just like a week in Mexico and then they come back and they go back. It is a day. It is a. This is something I'd say was daily. It's breath work. Yeah. It's meditation. It's connection. It's journaling. It's it's all the things that are kind of in the zeitgeist right now, manifesting. But that is all the feminine. And so if they are very, if they are, if they think about the women, do they do any of those things? The women I'm talking about. You know, about? some of them do. And I think, I think what some of them also, because you touched on it earlier that I think is connected to this is the unraveling how we were imprinted, like from our parents. Yes. Like, so the women that I'm thinking of, they had very strong, independent women moms that basically told them that when they were like, you don't need a man, you go, yes. you make your own money, you do this and empower them. And they ended up being these great, successful, smart women now, but they have that imprinted that they need to be this type of a woman so much where they probably need to- They can't be vulnerable. Soften, they have to yeah, be vulnerable. They need to, they need to unpack that and revel, so unravel that more and go yeah. like, it's, you know, because it's, they, I know they do a lot of the- the yoga and then touch their body and some of the things they're saying. So I, I see that side. I think they're, they're, they're sexual. They come, they grow up in this sexual family that I already told you about. So I think they have that aspect going for them positively, but I think that they've been told that they, they need to be this, mm -hmm. this strong woman and not need a man per se. <sighs> That's that, definitely and, the last 20, 30 years. I had that as well. I had that same, my mom was like, never rely on a man to take care yeah. of you. I was like, okay, like, I guess I got to do it on my own. Right. And I did. And that, yeah, I think some of that has probably been detrimental because I didn't really understand the need for, I had so many fears around partnership and I can do it all on my own. And then I realized like, no, I do, I do want a partner. And then I had to do a lot of work on what I actually want and thinking about all the, like, not just like, you know, you could write down things like I want him to have look a certain way. Like it's about like manifesting or being just very fucking clear and specific. Like, how do I want to feel with this partner? Like I would have them do some exercises about, what do they actually want in a partner? Like, what do you want to feel with them? What do you picture it? Like picture, you know, as it already is, like, what are you guys doing on a Saturday together? What are they, what are they wearing? What, what role are they taking in the house? What do you, how do you want to feel with them? You know, you want, do you want to feel loved? Do you want to feel cherished? Do you want to feel safe? Um, and then you got to like really do the scenarios of like walk and then unlearning all the other things. Like maybe they were dating toxic guys that didn't make them feel good. So mm. to supplant that, you have to think about what you actually do want. And I have a, I have a show up podcast I did on manifesting your partner, which I don't often talk about manifesting and feel like, oh God, that guy, you might lose people with that. But the truth is it's science, it's energy. It's like where you put your attention, that's what's going to happen to you. So getting really clear, because when you get clear on anything. Yeah, then you see it. You see it. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, that is not attractive to me. That person is nowhere on my list. Like I had a note in my phone of all the things that were really important to me in a partner. And I was able to, you know, find that pretty much. Yeah. I, I think it's very like, fucking clear. It's like when you buy a new pair of shoes and then you start noticing everybody has right. the same exactly. pair of shoes. Yeah, deal, so. <laughs> oh, those are there the whole time. Yeah. No, I, you know what's so terrible about that message that you don't need, uh, you know, because replace it with, you know, don't say a man. You don't need a partner. Yeah. Everybody needs people. We do. That's such a crazy message to sell yes. to anybody. And it's it's like men tend to be told like, um, if you settle down with a partner or you find a partner, it's uh, it's not fun. It's not going to be exciting. You should just go make money and just go hook up with people. Don't have any deep connections, which is also another terrible message. I think exactly. we're being sold terrible messages. We are being sold terrible messages. There's no depth to that. There's no substance. And like studies and studies, t time again, they will tell you that what we really need to be happy at the end of life, people say it's their connections yes. with people. It's, it's, um, that's why this loneliness epidemic truly is an epidemic. We want connections. We want intimacy. We want trust. We want all of those things. Do you think the reduction, the, the, the fact that people are having less sex is, is connected to the loneliness? I do. That's just, it's just it's, a side effect of that. Yeah. Loneliness, isolation, so, you know, um, technology yeah. and, Maybe there's been a reaction to like the hug up culture now. It's like, don't hug up. And 
So mm. yeah, I think. You, oh really? Do you it. think there's a bit of pendulum I swing think back? I do. Or? I do. Mm. Like I think when I first started, like, and here's the thing, like maybe f- almost twenty years ago, there was like six or seven books that came out about like the hookup culture. It was all about hooking up. But what the hookup culture was, people just getting really wasted in college and then having sex and feeling like they're like liberated. But that's not embodied sex. That's mm-hmm. not present sex. That's not connected. That's not the it's best sex of your life. Totally disconnected. So yeah. then maybe that on top of like. You know, a lot of young people, like even during the pandemic and social media, the apps and all those things, and maybe parents being more like, I don't know, I you know, I, kind of talking to their kids more about safety. And I don't know, like as a result of that, we're just mm. seeing like less sex happening. I, I heard um, someone on a podcast uh, talk about how um, one of the one of the the risks of having multiple partners, uh, especially for women, is that their ability to pair bond can become uh, challenged or or lowered with each successive partner because of the way women's bodies and brains react to sex with the octo- oxytocin and so on. And so if they start, if they, if they are with tons of partners or they treat it um, like this trivial thing that they start to, to prevent their ability or reduce their ability to pair bond later on, is there any truth to that? God, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that study, but I could see, huh? I, I don't know about that study. Okay. Okay. No. Yeah. Because they have more variety, maybe more things to. I think it measure, had more to do with just viewing the the act as this like just physical trivial thing, and so they prevent themselves or block out their ability to. You know, it's this whole hookup culture like side yeah. effect where it's like, oh, it's just sex. Just keep yeah, doing it. And it's no that. big deal, and then they they're, they're separating it from this deeper. Well, connection I do potential. see that. I definitely see it being like young people saying, "Oh, well, I I'm very liberated." Like I had a young. My like a friend's kid who's like in college, like twenty years old, and she was like, "Oh, I, I, I feel so like liberated right now because I'm having sex with." She's like, "I'm having um, like I have a friends with benefits." It's like it felt super liberating. I was like, "Well, what, what is that benefit?" She's like, "Oh, well, you know, we went, we ordered pizza together, we had sex, I gave him two blowjobs, and we, we had pizza, we fell asleep, then we went out the next day as friends." I'm like, "Okay, but what is your benefit? What did you get from that situation? Like, did he go down on you? Did you have any pleasure?" And she was like, no, no. But she just felt like I could have sex like a man, if you will. I could have sex and then Mm. be friends with them. And like that was missing the whole point of like connection and intimacy. So I think that maybe you could feel like I'm just like, I feel like that that whole mentality of a hookup, like I did it and I didn't care. Mm, I didn't catch feelings. It's that whole like, I'm going to have sex and I'm not going to catch feelings. So that makes me somehow like, I don't know, like it makes it superior and disconnected. But once you learn what great sex is about, so to go back to your earlier question, like I think it is about vulnerability, connection, safety, com- you know, communication, experimenting, openness. And then in that container, in that safe container, you can explore and play and have fun for days. Like there's mm. just like a workout. There's so many different ways you can get the abs, right? There's like a million different ways to do the exercise so you can get the result. Like if the result is you want is connected, satisfying, joyful sex, there's a lot of different ways to get there. There's a few elements that you need, but as long as you agree, like that's where we're going, we want to have that. There's like a, all these places to play yeah, inside cool. of it. Emily, you're always fun to talk to. Yeah. We could do this for another two I hours. I love this. this. A lot more this is so you guys are cover. fantastic. Yeah, this is great. I, everybody, I, I mean, you got a great podcast. Definitely get her book. She's she's amazing. She's our go-to person for this stuff. So Thank thanks you. for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, it's so fun. It. Thank, Thank you. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of weak points and and areas that I struggled with developing for a a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me, for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 